We also just uh, released our first poll in the Slack channel, uh, which is which kernel version first included support for eBPF? And the answer we is the possible- We also just uh, released our first poll in the Slack channel, uh, which is which kernel version first included support for eBPF? And the answer we is the possible- We also just uh, released our first poll in the Slack channel, uh, which is- I think we have been hearing a slight echo there. Apologize for that. So as people uh, stream in, um, one of the important parts of this conference is that we want to make it as interactive as possible. Uh, and one key aspect of that is why the Slack channel? So if you have just joined a live stream via either Zoom or YouTube, and you're not on the eBPF uh, Slack channel yet, now is a good time to join. You can actually see it on the screen right now. The URL is eBPF.io slash Slack, and it will lead you straight into the eBPF Summit Slack channel. You can chat to all the other, other conference attendees, um, and we will also use it for Q&A. And that one I was saying before that was uh, interrupted, we just started our first poll, uh, which is asking you a very fascinating question, which kernel version first included support for eBPF? And the possible answers are Linux 2.4, Linux 3.8, Linux 3.15, Linux 4.4, Linux 5.3, or Windows 95. And I see people are choosing all sorts of answers. Somebody is obviously laughing at Windows 95. I see Dennis has joined our Slack. Welcome, Dennis. Welcome, Francesco. Welcome, Pradeep, and welcome, William. For those joining the Zoom uh, stream, yesterday we had a couple of quality issues with uh, Zoom, and the YouTube stream was actually better. So if you experience any video or audio quality issues on Zoom, consider switching over to the YouTube stream. We will be uh, showing both URLs in the logistics section in just a bit. For those who joined, welcome. We will give everybody a couple of more minutes um, to join before we get started. We will start in about two minutes. Hello, Utaro. You just joined the EBPF Summit Slack channel. Also, if you are wondering how yesterday's day went and you have not been able to see it, we published a quick recap blog post today, which includes the live stream recording of yesterday, as well as a short recap of all the keynotes of yesterday as well. Roberto is obviously very exciting, excited about the summit day two. Hello, Mihai, you just joined. If you are looking how to join right now or have any issues, Joe just posted a, um, a, a pinned message that gives you all the pointers and the rules on how to participate in this conference. Um, includes both the link to the Zoom and YouTube stream as well and explains how the Q&A section will work. Hi, Grant. Hi, Dimitri. Hi, Nicholas. Oh, Nicholas, nice to see you as well. It's always good to see and, and uh, to see uh, familiar names and faces. I'm quite motivated to leave QProxy behind because of yesterday's talk. That's awesome. That's exactly what we want to hear. I think we had several talks yesterday mentioning how people got rid of QProxy and IP tables rules. And obviously a message like that is getting lots of rocket emojis. <laughs> All right, it's five after nine, so we will get started with this summit. Hello and welcome again to the BPF Summit 2020. I'm super excited to welcome all of you back to day two of the BPF Summit. My name is Thomas Grav. I'm one of the co-creators of the Cilium project. I'm also the CTO and co-founder of Isovalent and have been involved in eBPF and the Linux kernel for many years. For today, I will be uh, your host for this conference. Before we get to logistics, I would like to share something very important. Be nice and human to each other. We had a wonderful time yesterday, except for that. I can't say it in any other way, idiot spam in the conference chat for a bit. 
For those on the stream yesterday, I want to once again apologize for this behavior. We have banned the user and we have disabled the conference chat because Zoom gives almost no moderation controls. So again, be nice and be nice and human to each other in these difficult times. If you are unsure how to act, be a bee. Bees are nice. And yes, we do have a code of conduct. If you observe any inappropriate behavior, please report it to Beatrice or Dan in the Slack channel and we will act immediately. I know we all want to get to the first keynote. We have a couple of logistics to cover to make sure everybody is well set to enjoy the summit. First of all, you have two options to join the live stream. The live stream is available on Zoom and YouTube. Yesterday, the video quality on YouTube was considerably better for many of us. So if you run into video quality issues, consider switching to YouTube. Very important, if you, if you experience any problems, the best place to get help and report it is in the eBPF Summit Slack channel. You can join it by going or pointing your browser to eBPF.io slash Slack and follow the instructions. You will also find all the speakers and attendee in that Slack channel. We will use that very same Slack channel for all the Q&A. Um, for keynotes, we will be collecting the, the questions in the Slack channel and ask the keynote speakers live on the stream. And for lightning talks, the answers will be given directly in the Slack channel by the speakers. Yesterday, I had asked what mountain peak is in my background here. Uh, well, Bala got it right. Can we go to the next slide? Yes, Bala got it right. So congratulations. It was Santis. Uh, Bala will be getting this nice little bee as a thank you gift. And you obviously know what's coming, right? I have to make this harder for you. So let me switch my Zoom background. So for those of who, who know me, I, I will be, I, I'm spending a lot of time in, in this place. So again, if you guess the place right, uh, you will be getting a small gift. Uh, this same B will actually be giving, uh, given as a speaker gift to all the speakers uh, speaking at this event. We will be mailing this out after the summit is over. All right, next up are polls. We have been running several polls yesterday. In the first one, we have been asking about your background in EBPF. Based on the results, we have a good mix of different knowledge levels. Also, I really hope that the seven of you who are here for the virtual conference t-shirt are actually wearing it today. That in the next poll, we asked what XDP stands for. Many of you got it right, of course, but my personal hero is really Sonny, who has proposed an even more, answer, uh, an even more awesome option. Uh, and I think we should, we should really reconsider what XDP stands for based on this. The last poll we ran was an eBPF trivia question. And by the time we asked, the audience was already quite knowledgeable uh, on eBPF, so most of you actually got this right. Before we dig into the agenda, just a quick reminder again on where to get additional information throughout the summit. If you are new to eBPF and some concepts mentioned in the talks may not be entirely clear to you, eBPF.io is a great first resource for additional pointers with introductions to eBPF and a list of eBPF-based projects to get started because many of you will be using eBPF but not natively, but while one of the higher level projects. So if, it, if, if you're unsure about something, if you have questions, you can obviously ask in the Slack channel, but also go to eBPF.io uh, for additional resources. And then I almost forgot, we also have to name our eBPF mascot. So yesterday we have asked you for proposals and we have received many, many of you. So as you know, EB, the, this B is the, the mascot of eBPF. Um, and we will be naming it uh, as part of this summit. So in the Slack channel, you will find a poll that will be posted in a couple of seconds or the next couple of minutes that will ask you to vote on the proposals, on the best proposals that we selected. Again, thanks to everybody who has made a proposals. All right, enough talking. Let's get into the agenda so we can get started. We will start with a keynote from Alexei Stadovoitov. Alexei is a kernel developer working at Facebook and also the second eBPF co-maintainer. Alexei will cover eBPF security and talk about the safe programs, the foundation of eBPF, the foundation of eBPF. Next up will be Chris Nova. Chris is a maintainer with the Falco project. She will talk us through kernel tracing in production with Falco. We'll take a quick break and then have Brendan Gregg talk about performance wins with BPF. 
Brandon is working at Netflix and the author of several BPF books, as well as a longtime BPF community member. Following Brandon, we'll hear from Sang Lee. Sang is a software engineer at Google and will introduce us to Kubernetes network policy logging. One of the exciting features that was built using Cilium as Google integrated Cilium and eBPF into GKE. Finally, I will talk about the future of eBPF based networking and security. After taking a quick break, we'll go into the second round of lightning talks. It will work exactly in the same way as yesterday. All right, I think we are ready to go for the keynote. So let's go. Our first speaker of the day is Alexei Starovoitov. I, I basically just introduced him, but I will do again. Alexei is the kernel developer at Facebook and co-maintainer of eBPF. It's fair to say that together with Daniel Borkman, Alexei and Daniel created eBPF in the early days. Today, Alexei will be talking about eBPF safety in his talk, Safe Programs, the Foundation of BPF. Hello, and thank you for joining BPF Summit. My name is Alexey Starovoitov. I'm an engineer at Facebook, where BPF is widely used in various parts of the data center software stack. BPF technology wouldn't have had the explosive growth and adoption if it wasn't for, for its key concept of safety. Safety comes in different forms. The program may seek fault, but the system will not crash. Important data on, on disk is not at risk because the hello world did out of bound access. Every program is isolated from the rest of the system. The system is safe. Everyone takes this safety for granted. The kernel programming is different. The kernel is a monolithic blob of code. The kernel is one program written by thousands of programmers at once. You as a kernel developer could be very careful with struct skbuff memory access, but it's allocated by chemalloc from, from the common pool of objects with similar sizes. A bug in somebody else's code may force you to spend a day looking for a bug in your code that wasn't there. The kernel modules are no different. The kernel is not protected from bugging module. I think people assume that this is how things are. It's a price to do kernel programming. BPF changed this dogma. It brought safety to kernel programming. BPF gives developers freedom to make mistakes in their code without crushing the kernel. And when the program is polished and bug-free, BPF infrastructure enables developers to keep it safe. Another developer will be making mistakes in their program and they will not affect your program. That is a different angle of safety. In the early days of BPF, everyone was focused on making sure that the program cannot harm the kernel. That's a very fire job to check for. All memory accesses are within the range, that the program terminates, the loops are bounded, the usage of VPF spin lock helper will not cause programs to deadlock, there is no use of the free when object is freed, the program will not access it through a dangling pointer, that reference counted objects don't leak out of the program when the program does a lookup of a kernel object like socket, it will release it before exiting. Often it is hard to convince the verifier that the program is safe. Nowadays, hundreds, literally hundreds of VPF programs are running at the same time. It became important to isolate one program from another. Having a file descriptor to a VPF program guarantees that the program will not be unloaded. But until recently, there was no way for the user space to make sure that the attached VPF program will keep executing. VPF link was introduced to solve this problem. Having a file descriptor to a BPF link guarantees that the program stays attached to a particular event. But there was another issue. Any user space application running with root permissions could iterate over all BPF links and disconnect programs from events. Cap BPF capability was introduced to solve this problem. It grants unprivileged application and access to BPF system call and isolates programs and links because those file descriptors belong to different user space processes and processes cannot clothe each other descriptors. On one side, CAM BPF provides isolation of one BPF program from another. That's program safety. On the other side, CAMP BPF reduces attack surface, since an application that uses BPF 
no longer needs to run with root privileges. That is system security. It is hard to convince the verifier that the program is safe. The programs are typically written in C. LLVM compiler sees the intent of the program. It sees functions, variables, types, foreign while loops. It knows the programmer's intent. The verifier only sees the assembly code. It has to discover function boundaries, basic blocks, contraflow, gra graph, loop induction variables to prove safety. All of it from the assembly code alone. Every optimization pass of, of LLVM is playing broken phone game. Every step obfuscates the user's intent a little bit, which makes the verifier job harder. Here is one example where LLVM makes the verifier struggle. For humans, it is easy to see that register 2 and register 0 contain the same value. Hence, the value range discovered by R0 less than 0 uh, condition applies to register 2 as well. The verifier wasn't smart enough to see that. They fixed it. Now it can track ranges of equivalent registers and realize that R2 is within 0 to 256 range when the second, after the second condition. This range information is necessary to process R3 plus R2 instruction correctly since loads through R3 can only be allowed if R3 points to a valid memory. Why would compiler do sub to such optimization? Turned out that under register pressure, LLVM greedy register allocator introduced a copy of the register. This kind of transformation is not something we could tell LLVM, don't do this. We had to make the verifier smarter. Here is another example. After this LLVM optimization, the verifier cannot prove the correctness of the code on the left anymore. It understands the range of the variable B, but cannot correlate it back to the range of the variable A. So a valid program gets rejected. It is possible, but quite complex, to make the verifier track the relation between A and B. Fortunately, this optimization is done by the specific path called instruction combining. We've analyzed under which conditions this optimization is triggering and added an extra path to LLVM BPF backend that detects this pattern and inserts an optimization barrier, which forces LLVM to avoid this specific instruction combining optimization. In the first example, the mismatch between LLVM and the verifier was resolved by improving the verifier. In the second example, the LLVM was changed. The larger BPF program is, the more likely such coronal cases will appear. If you, as a BPF user, hit such a situation, please don't fight the LLVM and the verifier. Bring it up on BPF at Vigor main list, and we will continue making the verifier smarter and continue adjusting LLVM. Not only the verifier has to understand all transformations that LLVM did with C code, it has to detect spectre style attacks in malicious BPF program. Under speculative execution, the index is slow to load the index less than 256 condition could get mispredicted by the CPU and the array reference will happen out of bounds. The verifier can accurately detect such speculative execution in unprivileged programs and automatically convert them into masked index. This bit of magic ors and shift does not prevent speculative execution. Instead, it steers speculative execution into a safe range. That's where safety blends into security. After many years of gradually improving the verifier smartness, we hit the point where every small improvement means a lot of lines of code. It's challenging because the verifier has to rely on the assembly code alone. We could have taught LLVM to annotate the code, but the verifier would not be able to trust the annotations. We actually store the original C code in BPF ELF binary for introspection and debugging, but it's not used for safety analysis. The breakthrough came with type information. 
BPF type format was invented to describe types of functions and variables. It's a simple format that encodes struct names, fields, and sizes, function names, and prototypes, the aggregate types of C language. Now Verifier has the assembly code and types at its disposal to prove safety. There are three main classes of pointers. The first four main classes of pointers. The first three were natural for the verifier to recognize and validate. The fourth category is very broad. The verifier support was added for struct SOC, socket TCP SOC, but there are lots of other kernel data structures. Clearly, this approach does not scale. BTF type format came to solve this problem. It allows all kernel data structures to be recognized and memory access is proven to be proved for safety. The BPF, the verifier receives BPF type format from two sources. One comes with BPF program and another comes embedded in VM Linux. Both are checked for correctness and the VM Linux BTF is trusted because it was constructed as a part of the kernel build. In other words, the BPF subsystem knows the kernel internal layout of the data. The user space BTF is not trusted. It could be malicious or could have been compiled for a different kernel. LibBPF adjusts program instructions after matching program BTF with VM Linux BTF. Then the verifier matches every load and store in assembly with corresponding field and type from BTF. The end result that the pointer the reference is no longer an arbitrary load of four bytes. It's the reference of particular field in the kernel data structure. The verifier sees that the offset 112 in struct escapebuff is the reference of 32-bit LAN field. This BTF-based mechanism provides a new level of safety for BPF program. The verifier performs stricter type checking than the C compiler. For example, BPF, this BPF program is safe from C compiler point of view, but it's not safe for the verifier because arbitrary point recasting can lead to out-of-bound access. The verifier will reject such program. I think BPF flavor of the C language is a better choice for kernel programming. Soon we will not be talking about how BPF extends the kernel. Instead, we will be talking about pieces of the kernel that were rewritten with BPF because it's a safe choice. Let's take a look at another BPF program. This program will be executed at the end of exec system call. BPRM is a process about to be started. BPF program wants to read environment variables of the process. It's using BPF copy from user helper to access user space data. This access might cause a page fault and the kernel will try to page in the data. The page may not exist and the pointer could be incorrect, but it will not cause sec fault or crash. No matter how the BPF program is written, the execution of BPF program is safe. This example program has another interesting part of BPRM VMA memory dereferences. Unlike copy from user that reads user memory, the VMA and MM are kernel pointers. BPF type format provides the verifier with information about types of each kernel memory access, but these fields in kernel stretches could have been null. Hence, the verifier has to do more work to make sure the loads are safe at runtime. It's doing so with a mechanism similar to C++ exception tables. Just like C++ can throw an exception and unwind the stack, when the kernel page fault, it consults exception table that says which particular load instruction is allowed to fold and how to handle that fault. The verifier builds the table while verifying the program. The end result is BPRM VMA dereference is compiled as normal load instruction. It executes fast as native load. If it faults due to BPRM pointer being null, the fault will be handled gracefully without crushing the kernel. Have you seen kernel panics with null pointer dereferences? Just imagine all kernel code was safe like BPRM. Let's take a look at one last example before I conclude this talk. 
On the function entry, the first argument is a pointer to struct XKP metadata, and the second argument is an integer. Because the first program is global, the verifier will try to ensure its safety standalone. It will verify it with the assumption that R1 is a valid pointer and R2 can be any integer. Then later, when they verifying the second program, the verifier only needs to check that the first program is called with valid arguments. The verifier does not need to recheck the program one for specific pointer and integer values that is used in program two. This process is called function by function verification. It drastically speeds up the verification time. Note that it's not available to static functions because LLVM does not adjust type information when it optimizes static functions. BTF type format is a foundation for BPF libraries, for dynamic linking, for building larger applications all written in BPFC. It's important point that vanilla C linker does not check function arguments. It only matches names. BPF linker not ready yet, but it will do a type match. The BPF libraries, BPF dynamic link, will be safer than C. Maximum attention to safety in all aspects of BPF programming. That's what makes it unique. And that's why BPF is undoubted choice today for kernel extensions and in the future for kernel programming. Thank you very much, Alexei. What an amazing talk and a great example on how much thought and care is going into the security aspect of eBPF. Give a round of applause to Alexei in the Slack channel. Quick reminder, if you have a question for Alexei, please ask in the Slack thread that it was created by, by Joe for each talk. I'll be picking up questions from that thread. So let's uh, see, Alexei, can you hear me for the Q&A? Uh, yes, can awesome. you hear me? Yes, we can all hear you. I have a first question for you from Julia. Do you see a possibility to make the verifier strictness more customizable? I'm thinking about something like BPF-based unicorn applications where maybe the user can change the maximum instruction number, allow different access policies to the context and things like that. Okay, uh, very interesting question. Um, before, let me think it through. So, but before I answer the first question, I want to uh, wish uh, David Miller a fast recovery. Um, from the beginning, he was a big supporter of the VPF, and without his support, I think like VPF technology wouldn't have grown as big as it is today. Uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, back to the question. I think, like in a very far, like we've considered uh few things like for example one of the aspects we thought about like i would call it gradual safety for example like not always like you want to see uh you you, you like safety is like multi-dimensional uh concept right so when you filtering the packets uh, and uh, when you're doing a firewall, for example, you can block all the traffic to the host, right? So just, just by accident, by making a mistake in your program, the host will be not accessible. It pretty much just as bad as it's dead. Some uh, external system will come and reboot the host. So stopping all the traffic is just as bad as uh, crashing the kernel. So do we allow this yes we do today like with xdp you just drop all the traffic and that's your host will be dead so allowing certain things in a bpf that would that we disallow today is certainly in the cards like how to do it safely and without shooting shooting the users in the foot is a big question yeah i agree and next question is from tristan with strict type checks and robust error checking. I wonder if BPF at some point should become its own language rather than just restricted C. That is definitely true as well. Uh, I think we're already extending the language. So we use C just because that's how we started, but it's not limited to C. BPF traces its own language and it's vastly different than C. But even within C, we already made the changes that uh, like took it beyond what normal C allowed. For example, we have the uh, 
five or four or six uh, different built-ins um, that the LLVM support that they used for uh, compile once run everywhere extensions where language propagates the types uh, all the way to backend. So it is technically a different language like and a flavor of the C. It has certain things that makes it more restricted than C. At the same time, it allows more than what normal C does. Another example would be, we allow type information to be accessed from the language. Sort of like C++ uh, runtime type information, RTTI. Um, such concepts don't exist in C, but they exist in BPFC. You can just say, what's the type ID of, let's say, struct escape buff? And you will get a number that you can use like later to do like if type of pointer equal to type of the structure, which is pretty cool. Yeah, definitely a very interesting idea. Unfortunately, we're already running out of time for Q&A for this keynote. Um, you can reach uh, Alexei on WhatsApp and Twitter for more questions. Uh, there are a couple of more questions and we'll try to answer them in Slack and as well. So coming up next, we're coming to our next keynote, and I'm extremely excited about this one. Please join me in welcoming Chris Nova. Chris is uh, a maintainer for the Falco project, and Chris will be talking about kernel tracing in production with Falco. Please welcome Chris Nova. Hey, thanks for the, uh, the intro, Thomas. And I uh, want to make sure everyone can hear me um, before I... I get started. Yeah, so we can hear you loud and clear. Beautiful, beautiful. I hope everyone's having a good day today. It's good to see everyone. And uh, I, I kind of hacked the Zoom here. Um, so I'm going to steal the screen share from you really quick, Thomas. And um, I'm going to share this screen. And if I did everything right, yes, I, I was able to successfully join two Zooms with the same user account. Um, OK, so, uh, so let's get started. Um, and let me adjust this really quick. Do, 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 do. There we go. That's a little bit easier on the eyes. Okay, so we're going to be talking about uh, Falco with pr production eBPF. And uh, I think Thomas was patient enough with me to let me change my talk three or four times over the past few weeks. And I, I finally settled with this one for, for a number of reasons, particularly because uh, I think that uh, the more I look at eBPF, I'm absolutely in love with the technology that makes it work that we were just talking about with Alexei, but even more so uh, finding a, a concrete use case for it and talking about what it's like having an eBPF program in production where people are using it day after day and the nuances that come with it and come with shipping it and that come with developing with it. And so I'm gonna share a little bit of the human element of, of working with eBPF and what that's been like for us on the, uh, the Falco project. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, I'm traditionally an, an infrastructure uh, engineer by trade. I, I wrote a book called, or co-authored a book called Cloud Native Infrastructure with a, a great guy named Justin and uh, helped a lot with, with Kubernetes in, in the early days. Uh, I'm a maintainer of the Falco project, where I am fortunate enough to be supported by a fantastic group of, of individuals, most of which are, are based out of Italy. Uh, Lorenzo Fontana, uh, he wrote or co-authored a book on BPF. He, he spoke yesterday. Uh, he's one of our main maintainers and pretty much taught me everything I know about BPF. Um, I'm a hacker. I like to do things that I shouldn't do. And last but not least, I'm an alpinist, which I very much appreciate Thomas's Zoom background while he was talking. Okay, so uh, like, like all good engineering talks, we, we begin our story with a question or a problem. And, uh, and then we discover a set of constraints for that problem as, as we start to explore it. Uh, so the question, how do we instrument the kernel without a kernel module in GKE? And we're going to get into how this question was, was formed in the first place. And in order for you to understand how we got here, we're going to talk a little bit about this, this tool called, called Falco and, and what it does and, and how it works and, and, and how we even got ourselves in the situation of, of trying to understand uh, how we're going to run this program without a kernel module and why we even need a kernel module in the, uh, the first place. 
Okay, so uh, here is my very high resolution uh, <laughs> logo of Falco, the Falco project. Um, so just a little bit about Falco before we, we get too far into it. It is a, it's a runtime security tool. Uh, we'll jump into how it works and what it does in a moment, but on a political side, it is a, uh, it's a CNCF project, meaning that it, it started out as just a regular open source project and was later donated to the CNCF by uh, my current employer, a uh, company called Sysdig. And, um, and we donated the project and it is, uh, we advertised for it to be used for a number of things, specifically for what we call runtime security. In other words, securing a system um, at runtime instead of uh, trying to take some sort of preventative action before the system comes online. Uh, I look at Falco very much like a uh, CNCF sponsored cloud native surveillance system. And uh, already I'm, I'm sure most of your minds are going to kernel tracing and, and uh, how we're able to do a lot of things that we do. So, so that's uh, the political side of Falco. Let's talk about the, the technical implementation of Falco. How does Falco work? Um, <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, I've broken it down into four main things that Falco does, um, but let's let's really get into it here. So it rebuilds the state of the system at runtime. Um, if you've ever used the command line tool Sysdig before, or like strace or dtrace, um, you're probably familiar with this concept of, of taking information that's, that's happening in the kernel at runtime and bringing that up to, to user space somehow. Falco takes it a step further and uses the, uh, the Sysdig internal libraries and builds an abstraction layer on top of the information that we're, we're getting out of the kernel. So when we say rebuild the state of the system at runtime, what we're really saying is we're, we're taking all of the system calls that are executed against the kernel, the arguments that are passed to them, and we're, we're taking that and we're, we're trying to rebuild what's, what's currently happening. And we're also parsing other parts of the Linux kernel as well for different pieces of information, everything from uh, process tables to uh, various components that we're pulling out of memory. And we're putting all, of, all that together in an abstraction layer and, and giving that a, a well-known group of, of fields that you can then access and, uh, and do things with. Falco asserts those, those abstracted fields against a, an arbitrary rule set. And if one of those rules are violated, we, uh, we, we trigger an alert. The beauty of Falco is it, is it uses what, what we call and what most people call kernel instrumentation, which is a fancy way of, of, of saying what I just said. We're, we're tracing what's happening in the kernel. Um, uh, furthermore, Falco takes other information and, and combines that with what's happening in the kernel to give us a, a higher level, more enriched view of, of what's going on in, in the kernel. So if we, uh, if we come down here to, to Falco components, uh, I put together this diagram that will kind of uh, explain what it is we're able to parse and, and how, it's, how it's able to work. So on the left side of the diagram, we have arbitrary inputs into the Falco engine. And on the right side of the diagram, we have arbitrary outputs, what you can take out of the, the Falco engine. On the left side, we have the syscall events. This is kernel instrumentation. This is what's happening in the kernel as well as other Linux information as well. We have what we call the container context, which is just context that we're building from something like the, the Docker socket or some sort of uh, container level runtime. And we even take Kubernetes information as well. So uh, Kubernetes meta information about what's happening on the host, what namespaces are running on the host, what are the names of the pods running on the host, uh, arbitrary information, what do the labels look like? What do the annotations look like? Even the audit information, who did what, when, and where. We take all this together and we, we put together this, this enriched uh, stream of data and we assert it against a set of rules. And then using arbitrary output, you can then take action. So naturally a kernel module was our first approach here. And, and like Alexei just got done saying, there's, there's obviously a lot uh, that goes in with a kernel module and there's some trade-offs when you look at kernel modules versus uh, taking an eBPF or BPF approach. Both of which kernel modules and BPF are, are tightly coupled with the kernel itself. So there's a whole other exercise of evaluating that, um, that, that us maintainers were, were fortunate enough to get to go through and are fortunate enough to, to get to support. So anyway, that is Falco and how it works and what it does. And to give you a really quick concrete example, uh, let's take uh, somebody is calling an exec CVE system call 
Uh, we want to get the arguments that are passed to it so we know what they're trying to do. Uh, and then we want to be able to say uh, which container executed that system call and which namespace that container was running in. Uh, we could write a rule for that in the Falco engine, and then we could take that and we could uh, you know, shovel that over a gRPC socket somewhere and, uh, and take action. Maybe it goes to Prometheus, or maybe it sends an email, or, or it does something. Uh, it's just a simple alerting mechanism. OK, so that's Falco. Let's talk about kernel instrumentation. Uh, so again, we're, we're rebuilding the state of the Linux system at runtime. In Kubernetes, which is the primary use case for Falco, we, uh, we have a single Linux system per node, and we have multiple nodes in a cluster. So we're, we're faced with an interesting problem, which is uh, not only do we want to assert security rules on each of the nodes, but we want a, a higher level way of, of amalgamating all that data together. Um, so we're building this abstraction layer on top of Linux and on version, what you can think of as version 1.0 with Falco, we were using a device driver, which we're going to look at here in a moment. If, if Thomas gives me enough time, I can actually show you what this looks like. And, um, and then we are using a, a kernel module to create this device driver. Obviously, there's some security concerns with this, as well as some other uh, runtime concerns. Uh, particularly, we're loading foreign software into a kernel. This is scary, especially if you're running in production, and especially if you aren't a kernel engineer, or if you didn't write the code yourself, or if you haven't had a chance to load test this beforehand. Um, furthermore, in order to load this driver, you need access to the host. And, and that's sort of a violation of the, the security node boundary in Kubernetes. And last but not least, you obviously need privilege access to, to load something into the, the kernel. So we're, we're starting to walk down this path of there are some concerns with running a kernel module. So let's talk GKE. So we have some, some really notable constraints in GKE. Number one, you can't load a kernel module. That's just something that, that the systems that run GKE Kubernetes do not allow you to do. And uh, if, you, if you communicate with them and you, you talk to them and see what their alternatives are, they, they suggest something like BPF as a, as a solution to this. Um, so you're not able to load kernel modules on the host. Um, furthermore, the Kubernetes API is an installation constraint, meaning if we want to install something on the host, we need to be able to do it dynamically at runtime. And uh, finally, we want to be able to monitor all processes on the host. So something like ptrace wasn't going to be a viable solution right away uh, because we needed to, to basically scan all available PIDs starting at the true PID one on a host system. Uh, so Looking at these three constraints, it's it's pretty obvious that that BPF is the natural the natural choice here. It, it satisfies these and, and it gives us what we need to, to do what we want to do. Um, so here we have discovered uh, a very exciting moment in the history of BPF, a, a concrete production use case that that BPF is suited absolutely perfectly for. Um, so that's what we did. We wrote an eBPF probe, a very large eBPF probe at that. Uh, and we emulate this device driver, but without actually using a Linux device. Uh, we use trace points and probe tra functions to replace the kernel module. So we're now able to uh, trace various parts of the kernel at runtime. And the beauty of this approach was the rest of the system stays effectively the same. We basically were able to, to pull out the kernel module and replace that with a dynamically loaded eBPF probe. And we didn't really have to mutate any other parts of the, the Falco runtime system. It, it still observed data in the same way and still was able to, to get the same data it needed in the same way. And basically, it just became an, another data source or another input for the, the broader system. Uh, one thing to note is this was ever so slightly less performant than the kernel module, which writing this in C and C++, this is a concern for a lot of folks. Uh, but it still did satisfy those, those main constraints that we had earlier. Uh, so there was a few caveats with, with the eBPF, primarily the, the kernel. Um, which kernel you're running on has a lot to do with eBPF and, and um, I mean, even if you can run it at all, even if you can run it whatsoever. Uh, so the probe is compiled against the kernel and here in a moment, if I have time, I'm going to actually compile an eBPF probe and we're going to run Falco with it so you can see exactly what that looks like. And uh, I'm going to do a quick compare and contrast with Cling 9 versus Cling 10 with LLVM 9 and 10 and, and show uh, how we're able to hit a runtime problem with BPF. I, I found this last night, which I guess is a really good opportunity for us to share. Like uh, working on eBPF with newer kernels is exciting. You're, you, you find new things every day and it's, it's really, really exciting for everyone. 
Um, so it, it's a rare low level new utility. And what I mean by that is not many people are using eBPF today. It's low level, it's tightly coupled with the kernel and it's new, it's exciting. You know, every kernel release you're seeing new features and uh, LLVM and Clang are, are getting updates, uh, you know, very frequently. I mean, you go back and you look and you, you see commentary from 2019, 2020, and um, this is just a, a new and exciting space. And it's a really, really cool space to be a part of. So what we do is we dynamically load the BPPF probe from user space. Uh, we wrote it in C. It's just uh, probe.c, like Alexei was just talking about. It's compiled to an object, and we load it um, at runtime from the user space program itself, of course, with, with privilege access. Um, OK, so if, if folks have questions about that, um, feel free to, to let me know. And if not, I'm going to show three quick examples of Falco with a kernel module, Falco with BPPF compiled with Clang 9, and Falco with BPF compiled with uh, Clang 10, and, and, and just show the, the runtime uh, uh, impact of each of these. And I guess the beauty of the demo is it's, it's going to be very boring. It's not going to be exciting. And that's, that's kind of what we're trying to show here is uh, the seamless nature of, of our approach of, of supporting this. Um, so let's let's get started. So uh, the first thing we have is I'm going to go and I can zoom in a little bit here. It's probably a little bit easier. Uh, we have Falco checked out on my my local machine here, and you can see we have this this build directory. And let's let's go and let's actually start compiling a few artifacts really quick. So let's go into build, and you can see here we have uh, the driver directory, which is where we're going to compile our kernel module and our BPF probe. And if I which clang, you can see right now it's in user bin clang. And if I list opt uh, LLVM 90, then you can see here we have uh, a different clang in LLVM uh, version 9.0. So we have both that we can we can use here. So let's uh, really quick let's uh, let's make the BPF using clang uh, 10 10.0, and uh, and then let's uh, let's make the kernel module as well. Uh, I know we're compiling code during a keynote. And this is just what I do. Thanks for bearing with me. Great. So we have the kernel module, and then we have uh, the Falco user space binary. Where we'll compile this really quick. Do 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 do. Doing its checks, and uh, and then once we get this, we'll 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 show the the different components, and we'll perform the same exercise with all of these. Um, so while we're waiting for this to download, in fact, I can I already have it, but we can speed this up. Um, so anyway, we're compiling Falco and uh, we're going to get it up and running. And then to, to test it, all we're going to do is we're going to cat Etsy, uh, Etsy shadow here on my, my local file system. And, um, and that's going to trigger a Falco alert and we'll be able to see how we're able to replicate the same functionality at the system call layer from uh, both uh, the kernel module as well as the BPF probe uh, using Claim 9. And uh, I'm just going to cut this off. I've already got a Falco binary. I don't need to show you all how to compile it. Uh, if we which Falco, you can see it's it's already here. I compiled this last night. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to insmod uh, this this uh, kernel module that we just built, which is uh, here Falco.ko. And if I list slash dev and I pipe that to grep and look for Falco, you can see we have a device driver here on the left, we have Falco 1, and each one of these are for each of my CPUs here on my local computer. And if I now run sudo Falco, you can see the kernel module is uh, initialized. We're running the most recent version of Falco, and it's relatively boring. Nothing is happening. And if we open up a second terminal, uh, drag this over, and we'll sudo bash, and we'll cat etc shadow. I'm not actually going to do this where you can see it, but you can see here, uh, Falco did exactly what we wanted Falco to do. So now let's replicate this with BPF. So what we're gonna do is we are gonna sudo up, uh, now running as root. Uh, the BPF probes are pre-compiled here in the uh, Falco directory. And here you can see we have a BPF probe compiled with claim 10 and one with claim nine. And then this is just a sim link over to the Falco BPF object here. Uh, so let's let's remove the uh, the BPF object there, and let's uh, let's sim link. We'll do Clang nine first. Falco BPF Clang nine to Falco BPF .o, which is this is just where uh, the root user is going to expect to find the BPF object to dynamically load at runtime. 
So if we exit out of this and we run Falco with this Falco BPF probe flag, we're now going to be telling Falco to look for a BPF probe instead of a kernel module. And um, can't open, why can't I open this? Falco BPF error. Interesting, I, I don't know why it's unable to open this. I might have, uh, when I recompiled it, I might have gotten an error. Either way, hey Chris, um, this is- Hi, hey Chris, I'm sorry to interrupt. We're already a bit over into Q&A time. Uh, and I sure. want to get at least one question in before we go over into the break. Uh, maybe we can okay. show the, the demo in, in, in Slack as well. Okay, um, great. What's the, the question? Um, Irma is, is asking, does Falco need to somehow understand Kubernetes and would it also work with a different container orchestrator? Uh, the Kubernetes information that Falco gets is, is opt-in. It doesn't require Kubernetes to run, it runs on Linux. Um, it does, however, have functionality to observe Kubernetes events and Kubernetes information and also works with, with Mesos and a handful of other orchestrators as well. Basically, anything that runs Linux, it's Falco is going to be meaningful for, and then we can get more information based on the, the type of container runtime you're running on top of Linux. Awesome. I know it's really hard to, to, to put this into 15 minutes. I know you tried really, really hard, but we are trying to stay on schedule. So first of all, thanks a lot, Chris. This was a fantastic presentation. Falco has really come a long way. Please give Chris a big round of applause in the Slack channel. And this concludes the Q&A of this uh, first part of the keynote session. We will now go into our first break and we will continue in five minutes with the next uh, set of keynotes. Uh, after the break, we'll hear from Brendan Gregg and Brendan Gregg is working at Netflix and we'll talk about performance events with BPF getting started. See everybody in five minutes. And as everybody is getting fresh coffee, we have our second poll in the Slack channel. And actually, this was given away in one of the previous talks. What does BTF stand for? Bit twiddling fun, base transceiver frequency, BPF type format, or BPF test frame, BPF test framework.
For those of you who just joined, we're currently taking a quick break. We will continue in two minutes. I see Patrick has joined, welcome. If you, have, if you have just joined, we will continue with Brandon's talk in just a bit. Um, if you have not joined the Slack channel yet, now is the perfect time to do so. Point your browser to ebpfio slash Slack and get your free um, invite to the Slack channel. You can talk to all the speakers and all the other conference attendees. And I see lots of people answering the poll, the second poll question, what does BTF stand for? Bits twiddling fund base receiver, base tr transceiver frequency, BPF type format, or BPF test framework. Yeah, we have one minute to go before we continue with the keynotes. Just a quick reminder, if you have questions for the keynote speakers, Joe in the Slack channel will be creating a Slack thread for each talk. Please answer with replies to that Slack thread. It makes it simple for me to identify the questions for a particular talk. Sometimes questions can get lost in the applause. And Reno Reinorm just joined, hello. All right, we are getting back from the break, giving everybody a couple of more seconds to get settled in. We will continue with another highlight today. Uh, I'm super thrilled to introduce the next keynote speaker, Brandon Gregg. Brandon doesn't really require a, an introduction uh, in this context, but I will do it anyway. Brendan is a performance engineer at Netflix and author of books such as BPF Performance Tools and Systems, Pe Systems Performance. Brendan has also created and contributed to various BPF projects. EBPF-based EBPF tracing um, and performance troubleshooting would not exist without Brendan. Today, Brendan will talk about performance wins with BPF getting started. Please, please give a warm welcome to Brendan Gregg. G'day. I'm going to show you how to get started finding performance wins using the BPF technology. If you do a search for this topic, you'll find there's articles that are not really aimed at beginners and articles that were true but are now out of date. My goal is to help everyone get started quickly and easily finding performance wins. So what is BPF? BPF Nowadays is a technology that is a bytecode and an execution environment. It is no longer an acronym. If you search for this, you'll find many articles that are confusing and need to be updated. BPF does many things, but what I'd like to talk about is performance wins using BPF. Now, the best way to get started is to think like a sysadmin and not like a programmer. When you think about BPF, and it's a bytecode and execution environment where you can write programs, it's intuitive to start thinking, maybe I should write Hello World, and then from Hello World, I'll write something more complicated. That's actually not the best way to get started with BPF for performance wins. The best way is to install the tools and run them and get some quick wins. I used to be a system administrator a long time ago, and part of my job was to make sure that the software my company needed was available on all the systems so people could use it. So thinking like a sysadmin, we want to get value out of BPF. What can we install and how can we use it? BCC Tools has many performance tools that you can run straight away. And so install that and you can use things like exec snoop, open snoop, and so on. When you run exec snoop, that will help you identify problems of periodic running processes. You might be surprised at what you find. Things that you've forgotten about that are in CronTab that are perturbing the production performance of the system, increasing latency and increasing those tail latencies. 
OpenSnoop is another great tool to run to find misconfigurations. When the system is looking for files that don't exist, that maybe they used to exist, but they've since been lost in a system migration. TCP Life is another great tool for finding performance problems, and there you can look for unexpected TCP sessions. XT4 Slower characterizes storage system performance by showing you the latency at the file system level where it matters to the application. Biosnoop, you can use that to look for unusual disk latency patterns, and so on and so on. There are many tools. To give you an idea of how they get used together, last year we had a Cassandra database instance with poor performance. I began by using the IOSTAT tool, the standard system disk statistics, and could see that there was a read workload and a, some amount of disk utilization. This database service is very sensitive to IO latency. And so what I'd like to do is drill down into this workload and get more information about how it's performing. So from these high-level statistics, I then tried the BCC Biosnip tool. And that gives me lots of columns I can study. I can look at the latency per event for disk IO, the sectors, the disks accessed, and so on. But what caught my eye was Perl. I didn't know Cassandra was written in Perl. Cassandra is not written in Perl. Cassandra is a Java application. But here there was Perl doing a lot of disk reads. So having a look at what it was, I found it was Netflix EC2 Rotate Logs, a log rotation service that we have on all of our instances, but it had gone haywire on this particular instance, and it was causing a lot of disk reads. And that's it. The problem is solved. All I did was use a tool, it pointed me in the right direction, and I was able to get that performance win. I didn't have to do any coding. And that's my main recommendation for you is look at those tools. And I've picked five really good ones to start with and try running them on your systems and finding unusual activity. And you might find some quick wins as well. Apart from those five tools, there are many more to try. So this diagram I've drawn, this really captures what why Observer, BPF observability is special. It's because it lets us see into all these areas that previously were difficult. In this particular diagram, in black are the tools that were already published. They're mostly BCC tools. And in red, I have BPF trace tools, another front end. These are ones I developed for a BPF book, but they're also open source. So I've developed many of these tools, and my goal is to arm you to solve more than 90% of performance issues using canned observability tools alone. And these tools are very quick to run, and there's documentation with them so that you can get started in a hurry much more quickly than firing up a source code editor and trying to write BPF performance tools from scratch. Now, while the tools are great, the future of BPF performance observability for most people is going to be GUIs. I have an example screenshot here. This is developed by my colleague Susie at Netflix. And she has it so you can click on investigation reports, pick CPUs, file systems, networking, and then it gives you a canned report or, or wizard showing different tool outputs. And so if you think you've got a disk issue, you look at the disk report, and hopefully 90% of those disk issues are solved from that one report just by clicking a button. I think it's worthwhile to learn the tools, and my previous book covered the tools, because these GUIs are built upon either the same observability metrics or actually the same tool. So once you learn how to use ExecSnoop and BioLatency and BioSnoop, you see the same things in the future GUIs or the GUIs we're building now. One of the hardest things about actually getting good at BPF performance analysis is knowing how to interpret these. It seemed really easy in my case study where I went from IOSTAT to BIOSNOOP to PS. But when you're faced with an unusual performance issue, this sequence may not be readily apparent. So you can use the tools right now. You can use the BCC tools right now 
And then in the future, if this becomes a GUI, where you can click a button and get the same output, you have solid experience in how to solve performance issues and what the output of these tools mean. Now, I said think like a sysadmin, where sysadmins will install something and use it and not necessarily program. But sometimes sysadmins do program. Sometimes you need to do something that's a little bit extra than what the CAN software provides. And so sysadmins will do some shell scripting and some awk or sed. The equivalent for performance observability is BPF trace. BPF trace, which is very much like awk, allows you to write simple tools and one liners that go beyond the CAN tools. Now, there are times when you should think like a programmer and not like a sysadmin. That might be for the less than 10% of performance issues where the CAN tools don't solve and you need to write something custom. Maybe you're doing a BPF-based startup. You're debugging your own code. You're doing something that's not performance observability. BPF is a really big topic. You're doing networking, security. Then you will need to do a lot of BPF coding. And there's another reason. Learning BPF internals can help you use BPF tools even if you never write the code. And so that might be another reason to explore programming in more detail. Now, for coding BPF performance tools, the language you should start with is BPF Trace. It's the newest language that we've developed. It's concise, it's like pseudocode, and that makes it easy to develop and maintain. BCC is an older front end, but it's still in heavy use. And BCC has different languages that it provides. One of the earliest ones, or the earliest one, was the Python C interface. And a newer one is libbpf C interface. If you search on how to get started in BPF, you'll see much, many documents on the Python C interface, and I wrote some of them. But now we're actually, for the performance tools, we're moving into the, onto the libbpf interface because it doesn't require LLVM and it allows new lightweight tools to be developed. And so that's going to be the the interface for the future of performance tools. The Python C interface is from BCC will still see use for other uses. So you might be a BPF startup and you've built something upon the Python interface, you'll keep using that. Now I said you should start with BPF trace, and so here's an example so you can see what that looks like. For many years, I've been wanting to write a program or a tool to show me the effectiveness of the file system read ahead or prefetch algorithm to see if it's polluting caches because it's reading too much or if it's reading too little. And so I finally did it with BPF trace where I wrote the tool. It shows me what I decided to do was the age of pages that were read when they were actually referenced. And so if read ahead is reading lots of pages from disk that aren't referenced for many, many minutes, you know it's too aggressive. And so this gives a histogram, it's great. But what's really great is the source code for this fits on one slide. So I'm not going to go through the source code now, but this really shows the power of BPF trace. It's basically boiled down the problem into the pseudocode. There's no boilerplate here. It's just the tool itself. Now I mentioned in BCC, the new interface is libbpf and many of you may not have looked at it yet. libbpf, what it allows us to do is create these standalone binaries that have BPF bytecode embedded. And so earlier this year, I coded OpenSnoop, and you can see there's it doesn't use libllvm, and stripped, it's 151 kilobytes. So think about that, 151 kilobytes for a standalone binary, a BPF performance tool that just runs. And you can run this on embedded systems that have storage constraints. So that's really exciting. For BPF trace, that's quite different. BPF trace runs those scripts or text programs. We're hoping to come up with a static BPF trace that's similar, that uses BTF, the BPF type format, so that it doesn't need all of this LLVM compilation. And so we can have a static BPF trace plus many scripts, also taking a small average tool size and making it suitable for embedded environments. 
To make the future work, we do need this config option set. So as a public service announcement, please make sure config debug info BTF is set to yes. And Ubuntu 2010 does have it. Now about the future of BPF. So I've done a lot with performance tools, but BPF is more than just performance and observability. So we'll be able to write kernel mode applications in BPF. And there are many advantages of those. And it's, it's different. In a way, we need to redraw the system diagram. So there's user mode, kernel mode, and now this special BPF kernel mode. This isn't the first time that an op the operating system model has been changed. There have been many research projects about different OS models, but they have not seen widespread use. BPF is seeing widespread use, a new type of software. So that's really exciting. I've drawn this diagram to explain why BPF is different to user mode and kernel mode. And so it is user defined and it is secure. It's failure mode is error messages. And it has better access to resources than writing user level applications. Although I need to add IOU ring is another new technology that helps with user mode applications there. So the takeaway is if you're new to BPF or if you're not new to BPF, please find some BPF performance wins. Think like a sysadmin, install BCC and BPF trace, get the performance tools available, run them, find some wins. This is really important. And what motivated me to create this talk is some of my coworkers are getting into BPF and they're beginning with these hollow world complex programs. And after a few days of compiler errors, they haven't gotten anywhere. And so they're starting to get a bad taste about BPF. So I think it'd be great if you all use BPF, use the CAN tools, which try to solve 90% of performance issues, find some wins to start with, tell your management, your company, BPF is great, we should continue investing in it. And here's concrete proof about things that solve for us. And once you've found some performance wins, then by all means, do programming, write your own tools, write your own things. But start with the tools, find some quick wins. So you're starting in a great place. From re for references, I do want to mention, I did do a blog post about this at the start of 2019. That's still generally true, where I say, try B BCC tools first, then BPF trace, and then you can get into more advanced development. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brendan. Fantastic presentation. Really exciting introduction to eBPF. Quickly checking, Brendan, can you hear me for the Q&A? Yes, I can hear you. Excellent, welcome. So if you have a first question, we'll dive right in. Um, and in the meantime, everybody can give a warm applause in the Slack channel. Uh, first question, BCC tools, BPF trays are cool. Do you, do you recommend any tools to create some scenarios, simulated environment on my machine so that I can use these tools to debug? Just playing with these tools on a normal desktop machine is kind of boring. I'm aware of some tools like TaskSet. Do you, do you recommend anything else? So if you start running these tools on production workloads and you don't have any familiarity, it can be confusing because you're seeing things for the first time. So it's a good question. And what I recommend you do is to start with micro benchmarks and you can also write your own micro benchmark. Imagine you write a 20 line C program that does this type of file system IO or this type of network IO. You understand at a very low level, the workload that's applied. Now you run the BCC or BPF trace tools on your own workload and see how that matches. You can also use off-the-shelf microbenchmark tools like Jens's FIO for file system tests or NetPerf for networking tests. That's a great way to get experience and get the hang of the tool output. I also, I mean, I, I run Linux on my laptop and so I'll run the tools on Chrome and Firefox and like everything. And so I'm always getting familiarity with what's going on and discovering things. It's definitely a great way to explore the system just by running these tools. Uh, Tristan is asking, with BPF trace and libbpf being so good, is there, is there still room for BCC? 
So with BPF Trace, if I'm writing new tools, BPF Trace, like a sysadmin, is, is what I use to hack something together. It's just so quick. It's like putting something together in org. And most tools I create are going to stay as B, BPF Trace. Now, there are some tools where this is so, this is going to be so commonly used. I, I want to keep developing it and I want it to have all these command line options and custom arguments. And at that point, I'll look to moving it to, to porting it to BCC, have a libbpf version. So you can run minus H and it has all these complicated things that you can use. So I think probably one in 10 tools that I create going forward are going to be such a common use case that I'll put them in BCC as well so that we can develop them further and add all those arguments. But a lot of the more niche ones I'll leave as a BP, BPF trace tool because it's easier to maintain that way. And then someone is asking how much performance overhead do BPF tools contribute? Are there any specific tools for which we need to take overhead into account, into account compared to others? As a performance engineer, you always need to take overhead into account. In fact, whenever on Hacker News or wherever someone posts a new observability tool or whatever, I do keyword search for overhead on the GitHub page. And if it's not mentioned, it's a telltale sign that they haven't really studied their own, the effects of their own tool. So I write man pages for all of the tools and I have a section in every man page on overhead. The overhead is relative to the frequency of events that fire and also what the event does. In my last book, I had a, in the tips and tricks chapter, I talk about getting your head around overhead, uh, example frequencies, and also did measurements for the overhead for different BPF tools. And we also saw a good lightning talk from Datadog where they talked about the different interfaces so you can get the CPU cycles for instrumentation events. But it's the main thing to think about is what's the frequency of events. If it's things like disk IO and you're not a database server, you're probably doing less than a thousand events per second, that's gonna be negligible. If I'm tracing scheduler events, that could be a million a second. It's going to start to be measurable. If I'm trying to trace user space malloc, that can be 10 million events per second. That's actually going to start to hurt. And so I always think about what's the rate of the events. But again, I do document it. So all the tools have a man page and I talk about the overhead for each. And I have one last question here for you. You have worked with many tools over the years, including Dtrace. How would you compare DTrace and eBPF these days? eBPF has gone further than DTrace did. When I was working on DTrace, there were these, some people had ideas about how about we did a security product with DTrace because we can trace events and then we can see if people break into the system. DTrace was always designed as an observability tool and it would drop events if the system was overloaded. And so that never met non-repudiation requirements. And because there was always a vector to, for uh, malicious attackers to evade detection. And so eBPF is going in all these places that we kind of had ideas about, but Dtrace couldn't because eBPF is not just about and not just about observability. And there are also, I mean, when I, when I wrote the BPF book, BPF performance tools, I, didn't publish it until I ported all my DTrace tools over and I was satisfied that it met that bar. And so uh, at the moment, like, I mean, DTrace, I, I will, I'll take DTrace over nothing. So if I log into a system and DTrace is there, at least I can do low level debugging, but eBPF has gone further, not just in observability tools, but also these other applications. Excellent. I think we could keep talking for a, for, for a long while, but unfortunately we have to uh, move on to the next keynote. I hope you can stay on the Slack channel a bit longer and answer some of the additional questions. Before we go to the next keynote, please give Brendan another round of applause. Fantastic talk. Thanks a lot, Brendan. Thank you. And I'll be on Slack. Excellent. Our next keynote speaker is Sang Lee. Zhang is a software engineer at Google and contributed to Kubernetes and also a core member of the Cilium team. She is working on GKE, Google's Kubernetes engine, and will talk about Kubernetes network policy logging today. Please give a warm welcome to Zhang Li. Hello. 
Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming to my presentation. My name is Zhang Li. I am a software engineer in Google and GKE and Atlas. Thanks to Thomas Graf, who invited me to give a talk here. Today, I'm going to talk about how to achieve Kubernetes network policy logging with eBPF. I will start by describing what's Kubernetes network policy and what are the challenges we are facing on logging network policy actions. Kubernetes network policy is used to specify which paths are allowed to talk to one another. Network policy is defined based on the path labels. Here is an example of network policy. It first selects the target path this network policy should apply to. In this case, it's database path. It then specifies who is allowed to talk to the target path. In this case, only front end path is allowed to talk to database on the TCP port 80. All other ingress connections to the database path will be denied. This is illustrated in the diagram on the left. The green path is allowed to talk to the blue prompt on port TCP 80. If the red path tries to connect to database path, it will be rejected because no policy allows this connection. Note that if a path is not selected by any network policy, it's open. A path can be enforced in one direction or both. Multiple policies can select the same path and the policies are union together in a whitelist model. These properties need to be considered when designing network policy logging, as we will show later. Network policy is a Kubernetes V1 API, but it doesn't have a unified implementation. Instead, it's implemented by various CNI providers, including Calico, Cilium, WaveNet, etc. The implementation can be based on different data plans, such as Apptable, eBPF, OVS, and so on. The common approach to implement network policy is to pass the user configured label based network policy and convert them to programmable and matchable rules in data plan per part. The resulting policy rules could look quite different from what user configured due to optimization and processing. Being able to enforce network policy is not enough. Many security conscious customers not only want to enforce the network policy, but also want to know what is enforced which connections were denied and when, which connections were allowed by which policy, etc. This information is useful for them to monitor abnormal situations, to debug the traffic, and to satisfy the auditing requirements. The visibility requirement has been a top ask for many of our customers. It's also a challenging task because we not only want to log the connections, but also want to log them efficiently. Some paths are not enforced, so we shouldn't log them. So we need to be able to control logging in the data plan on the fly. Also, we need to provide the relevant path information because path IPs come and go. Multiple network policies can all match the same connection. We should list all of them when queried so that the user can use this information for further analysis. We want to do all this with minimal impact to the data path performance. Once we identify the goal and the requirement, we need to decide on top of which data plan we should implement this feature. Clearly, the old way of IP tables cannot satisfy our needs. The functionality there are hard to extend. The logging approach it provides is clumsy. The policy matching mechanism it uses is known to be inefficient on large scales. So we started to look for alternative data path options. A data plan that can not only work for this feature, but also be able to support many more powerful new features on observability, security, and connectivity that GKE plans to offer. After investigating various data plan options, we decided to implement this feature based on eBPF. 
Of course, you already know this since I'm now talking on eBPF subject. The biggest advantage of eBPF is its flexibility and programmability. We can easily insert the bytecode to learn this kernel without the need of reloading the submodule. And we can modify the data used by the eBPF program on the fly. With the kernel perf event buffer, we can easily pass a message from the kernel space to user space as well. The ability to enrich the kernel with user space information without jumping back and forth between the two spaces enable context-aware operations on network packets at high speeds. The programmability of eBPF also allows us to easily extend the functionalities for our future offerings. As a result of the investigation, GK decided to adopt the eBPF technology with Cilium, which is the biggest open source project on applying eBPF technology to Kubernetes. Thanks to the large number of talented and diligent contributors to Cilium project, Cilium already provides Kubernetes network policy support, along with other functionalities. And it also has a very nice framework uh, attaching eBPF programs to various hook points in Kubernetes networking stack. Therefore, we can easily implement the policy logging feature on top of Cilium. Now, how do we achieve policy logging with eBPF and Cilium? Let's look at the traffic path. Packet will come into the Kubernetes work node through ETH0. It's then forwarded to each path by kernel through routing. To apply network policy enforcement, the policy enforcement functions are inserted to the TC hook on the interfaces that connect to each path. The function will make policy verdict decisions based on a couple of eBPF maps and the packet, in particular, contract map, identity map, and the policy map. The contract map helps to track the state of the connection. The identity map helps to extract the policy key from the packet header. And the policy map contains all allowed identity and port combinations and is converted from the user's network policy configurations. All maps can be updated on the fly. If a matching entry is found from the policy map, the packet is allowed and is delivered to the pad. If no matching entry can be found, the verdict is denied and the packet will be dropped. This diagram illustrates only ingress policy enforcement, but you can imagine that the egress would work in a similar way. To enable policy logging, we need to add a notification event when the policy verdict is made, and then pass it to user space. How? We can use the perf ring buffer. Perf event buffer is a high performance, lockless, per CPU memory mapped ring buffer, where the eBPF program can push customer data and the full or truncated packet contents to a user space application. Because this buffer is per CPU, lockless, and in memory, writing customer data to the perf buffer will be very efficient. A BPF helper function, BPF SKB event output, is available for writing data to the buffer. So from the policy enforcer function, we can simply call the function which are with the data we would like to push to the ring buffer. Once the data is passed to the perf ring buffer, CNN monitor would be notified to read the data from the buffer. Then the monitor reader will subscribe to the events and get them for further processing. Note that the monitor and the post-processing are all in user space, where we have more power to do more complicated operations. Also, the monitoring process and the data plan process are asynchronous. Once the data plan puts the data into this perf ring buffer, it would return and get ready for the next packet. This way, we make sure that the data path is not impacted by processing in the user space. What data can we pass to the perf ring buffer? It's actually very flexible and 
totally decided by us. We can include anything that's helpful, such as event type, source, verdict, direction, etc. The data we used for the policy verdict event is shown on the right, where the notify capture header is a common header that contains the event type, source ID, etc. And the additional fields are customized to our needs. This data will be passed in binary format to the user space. So we need to make sure that the structure used at the receiver side is aligned to what's being defined here. Another optimization we did to this feature is to output events only when necessary. We generate the policy verdict event only if the packet is for a new connection. Some paths are not in first or in first only in a certain direction. For the packets that are not uh, enforced, they will still pass through the policy enforcement function, but all packets will be allowed. We don't want to generate policy verdict events for them. An advantage of using eBPF is that we can easily insert a check to only write events to the periphery under certain conditions. The information of whether the endpoint is enforced and in which direction can be stored by a flag, which is um, in the static data that the BPF program has access to in its execution. Although it's not an eBPF map, it can still be updated on the fly by using ELF substitution. By making this flag to be volatile, the program will fetch the most updated value of the flag on every execution and compare it against the packet to figure out whether to log the verdict event. We can see the generated verdict event with the set and mantle function. Here is an example output where we run a mantra with a type policy verdict. The lock will show from which endpoint this event is generated, the remote identity, the traffic information, direction, and verdict action, etc. If a packet passes through multiple enforcement points, such as one at egress and one at ingress, we may see multiple events corresponding to the same packet. Although the event is generated, it doesn't contain all the information we needed to present to the user. One information we need is which policy allowed the connection. The other one is a notation corresponding to the path IPs. Because the event passed to user space, we can easily retrieve this information from the in-memory cache in the control plane. Remember the processing is done in user space and is asynchronous, so it doesn't impact the efficiency on the data path. We implemented this logging idea in, in GKE and exported the policy verdict events to GKE cloud logging in JSON format. Here is an example log output seen in cloud logging. It shows that the part Client allow in default namespace talk to the Kubernetes pad in Kub system namespace. The connection is allowed by an allow all network policy, which was programmed so that we can see all connections from this pad. There are also a couple of other fields that are not expanded here due to space limit, such as connection field, which will show the original traffic tuples and also timestamp to show when this connection was happened. The exact way of using this feature is provided on this link uh, to the user guide. Kubernetes policy logging is the first feature we developed on top of eBPF, but we already see its great potential. eBPF's ability to augment network packets with constraints with custom metadata enables a long list of possible use cases. It can help us to enhance the observability, security, and many other Kubernetes-aware packet manipulations without sacrificing performance. We are very excited about embracing this new technology and contributing to the CDM community as well. Here are the related blog posts if you are interested in reading more.
this is the end of my talk. Thanks, everyone. If there's any question, please feel free to post them on CDM. Thank you very much, Sang. Thank Great you. presentation. Please give a round of applause in the Slack channel. And we have we have a first question. Um, what my question is: What is the difference between using Cilium network policy and network policy? Okay, sure. <laughs> so network policy um, is a, a um, API that's defined by OSS uh, Kubernetes community that's agreed there, and it's a standard API there. Uh, but um, uh, Kubernetes didn't have a standard implementation there. Right. So um, when various CNI provider tries to implement this, some of them feel like, oh, we want some extended functionalities. I mean, at least that's my understanding. Um, so that they, they define their own format so that it's just easier for and quicker for them to extend. Because otherwise, if you modify Kubernetes um, if policy, it takes a longer cycle. Right. So that's my understanding. So that different um, providers start to do their own network policy, um, so that they have they can have uh, more uh, semantics. Like for example, like Cilium did some yep. much more, right? Um, and so I think the purpose is similar. It's just that to maybe better satisfy users' need. Also, right now in OSS, we also have a work group to try to improve the current um, Kubernetes network policy to try to unify the behavior uh, so that we can um, better uh, serve the community. So Thomas, if you want to add something, please feel free. No, I think that's a, it's a perfect answer. Selim <laughs> network policy is simply like the, the Selim specific extensions that are not in the upstream Kubernetes network policy format. The next question is, do you also lock traffic that was dropped or denied? And if yes, how often do you lock these events for every packet? Do you have some kind of rate limiting? Do you have some kind of aggregation? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, yes. Um, so if, if a packet got dropped, right, because the connection is never established, right? so that means um, you cannot really do it per connection because every packet keeps coming, right? And so then the question is, are you going to, to log off there? Are you going to do some aggregation there, right? Yes. Um, that, that's actually a very good question right now. So you can, um, you can, uh, depends on which level you want to put. Like for our case, we simplify it. We will say, okay, you put to the perf events and we are going to aggregate at the upper layer, the user space. Right? But ideally, theoretically, you can also say, okay, I'm trying to aggregate um, um, in the database, in the data plan. That's definitely more efficient if that's one. Mm -hmm. That just needs a lot some more work. For example, some common approach is you, even you drop, you still have a contract entry so that for a short time, which is, well, that's some, just some possible approach for you to um, to try to aggregate the drops in different level. Yes, that's, that's definitely uh, something we could uh, improve in terms of performance. Okay. Do you already have plans to develop Kubernetes network policy logging further? Or do you have a roadmap of some kind? There is an open source um, um, work group on network policy right now, trying to improve the semantics uh, uh, or provide more functionalities for uh, OSS uh, Kubernetes network policy. Once that API is defined, right, we definitely want to um, extend it further and, and support them. And GKE also have some work to uh, get more functionality there. Uh, yeah. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Sang, for your nice keynote. And again, give a round of applause to Sang Lee in the Slack channel. Thank you. Thank you. Please stay in the Slack channel. There's a couple of more questions that we didn't have time to get to. Yeah, I can answer that, yeah. Thanks. All right, thanks again. OK, it's going to become a little bit weird because I don't really want to introduce myself, but I'm up next. So we will just uh, make this quick and painless. In this next talk, uh, I will talk about the future of eBPF-based networking and security. Let me see if I can share my slides here. All right, so I hope everybody can see my slides at this point. 
but I'm switching from a uh, moderator to a uh, Cilium Core team member at this point, and I will switch back afterwards. So hello, my name is Thomas Grav. I'm one of the co-creators of Cilium uh, and the CTO and co-founder of iSurveillant, the company behind Cilium. Before founding iSurveillant, I have been a kernel developer for many years working on networking, security, and eBPF. In this talk today, I will be sharing my thoughts on the future of eBPF-based networking and security. Specifically, we will answer the question, why is eBPF the future and how will this future look like? Before we can look into this future, we need to take a quick look at the past. So let's briefly look at the history of networking. In the 90s, uh, it's a long while ago, networking was almost entirely physical, cables, perimeters, and a lot of layer two, hardware and layer two. This was also the era of dial-up modems. For those of who you remember, for those of you who remember these times, I've link, included a link where you can listen to the sounds of dial-up modems and related equipment. For those of, who, of you who don't, also listen and remember that those sounds were once associated with excitement. Around the same time, 1999, IP tables was created by Rusty Russell as a uh, successor for IP chains. And shortly after, PF was released by Daniel Hartman, Hartmeyer for, for BSD. Both projects focused on software-based firewalling and were primarily designed to protect the host or replace hardware-based firewalls. In the year 03, VLANs were first described. The first release of the Xen hypervisor happened and EMC acquired VMware. This was the start of the virtualization era. KVM was first merged into the Linux kernel just a couple of years later in 07. However, from a networking perspective, nothing much changed. Networking uh, of virtual machines was delegated to the underlying physical network by bridging VMs directly to the network with layer two bridges. Almost no network logic existed in software. Most of the focus in networking in the Linux kernel was on the TCP IP stack or optimizing Linux as an operating system to run applications. It was the year 2009 when things got exciting again from a software networking perspective. It was the year of the first open vSwitch release. Th these were the early days of software-defined networking or SDN. It brought massive programmability, virtual networks, and overlays to Linux. This was the start of the network virtualization era and led to a massive move of networking logic from hardware into software. 2010 was also the year of the first OpenStack Summit. I'm sure many of you remembered that as well. Going further, year 2013 brought us Docker. Docker from a networking perspective primarily inherited the networking from the, from the virtualization layers. Uh, and containers were treated pretty much like miniature VMs. Uh, the fundamental shift brought by Docker initially focused on application packaging with container images and not necessarily on the infrastructure side. Almost all of the early networking solutions for containers were inherited from OpenStack days. In 2014, something exciting happened again. The first commit to Kubernetes happened. Kubernetes was obviously not the first to attempt to translate high-level user intent into infrastructure automation, but it made unique choices to make a lot fewer assumptions in networking security and many other aspects which define how infrastructure is configured. For example, there is no concept of a network or subnet in Kubernetes. This allowed for a massive innovation. The era of containers begins. But Kubernetes also wanted to get a complete enough state as quickly as possible, so it heavily relied on IP tables, which was at the time the most widely available way to perform networking, uh, network filtering on Linux. Well, IP tables was created while some of us still use dial-up modems, so it's not surprising that the underlying design of IP tables is not a perfect match for modern cloud-native workloads. So how does eBPF fit in? Well, in the same year that Kubernetes started, eBPF was first merged into the Linux kernel. And just one year later, the eBPF backend was merged into the LLVM compiler suite, allowing for LLVM to emit eBPF bytecode. 
Also, a new eBPF classifier made Linux networking programmable with eBPF for the first time. And finally, the BCC project was announced, which would later revolutionize application profiling and tracing. And now, as we see, BPF trace is succeeding BCC as well. 2016, XDP was merged into the Linux kernel, enabling a high-performance data path where eBPF can run directly in the driver of a network device, as close to the hardware as possible. This, would, this is what later unlocks the development of several load balancer that, now, that are now used uh, in some of the largest data centers today. It was also the year we first announced the Cilium project. Cilium had and still has a very simple goal, provide networking, security, and observability for Kubernetes and cloud-native environments using eBPF. It has been designed from scratch to leverage all the powers of eBPF in a native way. What does that mean specifically? Let's have a look. Looking at this from left to right, we have started with hardware networking where the functionality and scale are mostly predefined by the hardware. This applied long innovation cycles and was designed for the age of physical servers. We went through the era of software defined networking, which moved a lot of logic from, from software, from hardware to software. It did so by bringing hardware networking concepts into software. We literally took functionality previously done in hardware, wrote it in software, and slapped the word virtual in front. This is obviously a bit harsh and simplified, but think of this era to still think in programmable flow tables, IP addresses, and ports. The programmability was clearly networking specific, but it brought an amazing set of innovation for the age of virtual machines. What is different with Cilium and eBPF? As you, as you have heard at this summit, eBPF is used for much more than networking. It is getting closer and closer to a general purpose execution engine. So from a programmability perspective, it's much more powerful than any programmable flow table. Brandon just mentioned this in his last keynote. He has been talking about like BPF, a new, BPF as a new type of application running in kernel space. I think this is, this is mapping very well to this. Solium translates high-level intent defined by the user, for example, in Kubernetes, directly into code. You could think of this as networking as code if you want. It means that we can decouple networking from the security and visibility layers entirely, which has incredible benefits as we steer towards multi and hybrid cloud use cases, multi-cluster use cases, and attempt to bridge traditional data centers uh, with modern cloud deployments. Cilium understands the security identities of applications and application level protocols such as HTTP and DNS. But most importantly, it makes the networking layer application aware by utilizing eBPF at layers above the networking think system calls and sockets, while remaining completely transparent to applications. This allows building a networking and security layer specifically designed for Kubernetes and the cloud native age. Back to the history. Even though we had announced Cilium and the vision was very clear, we were still in the building phase. In parallel, Brandon Gregg, who we heard earlier, uh, started talking about Linux BPF superpowers with amazing presentations on eBPF for tracing. Facebook revealed using an eBPF and XDP based load balancer replacing IPVS at 10x performance. I think a lot of us still remember the moment where those slides were shared. This was later released under the project Katron or Katron. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it correctly and I haven't had my shot of vodka yet. In the same year, Cloudflare shared their plans to perform DDoS mitigation with eBPF. 2018, Cilium 1.0 was released Big moment for us, um, and obviously we also released 1.1 one, one and 1.2 one, in the same year, which extended the feature set massively. It brought things like Kubernetes cluster IP load balancing, FQDM policies, and multi-cluster networking. It was also the year BTF was merged into the kernel that made the kernel self-descriptive. This later unlocked shine features in the tracing world. In 2019, BPF Trace was announced, which is providing a higher level abstraction compared to BCC, and it was another giant leap forward for, for tracing. We just heard about this in Brandon's keynote. We also released Cilium versions 1.4 to 1.6 with things like IPV lens support, transparent encryption, 
eBPF templating, a full queue proxy replacement, so you can get rid of those IP tables rules, CNI chaining to operate with other CNIs, and socket-based load balancing, and even an AWS ENI mode to natively integrate it with cloud provider networks. These days, we also have the same for GKE, as we just heard in the last keynote. But even more exciting, we released a Hubble open source project, an eBPF-based visibility platform for network, service, and security visibility. Finally, clearly another major milestone was the release of Brandon's new book, BPF Performance Tools, and now he's just about to, I think, releasing uh, the second versions of System Performance, which may have found its place as the de reference book for eBPF already. It's not the only book on eBPF, of course, but possibly the most complete at this point. This brings us to today. Um, this year, Cilium 1.7 and 1.8 have already been released, which brought XDP-based load balancing with DSR, similar to how it is done with Katron. Uh, the ability to protect the host itself with eBPF, as well as things like session affinity for load balancing. Obviously, another major milestone for eBPF-based networking, and specifically the Cilium project, was Google's announcement this year regarding the availability of their new networking data plane for GK, which is Google's Kubernetes engine built entirely on Cilium and eBPF. Now, already looking a bit into the future, in a couple of weeks, we will be releasing Cilium 1.9, which will bring maglev support, consistent hashing, a bandwidth manager, deny policies, VM support, or more generally speaking, support for external workloads running on VMs or metal outside of Kubernetes, and things like T-proxy support with eBPF. So what is next? We will see various things. We will see more eBPF at the edge load balancing with eBPF and XDP. We heard from Laurent yesterday how Datadog is looking to move into this direction of Cilium. There are several eBPF-based options already which are quite opinionated. Cilium will focus on a general purpose implementation to bring the speed, visibility, and flexibility of eBPF and make it consumable for Kubernetes and cloud-native environments. We, all, we already have done big steps by enabling XDP-based load balancing and the introduction of maglev and session affinity. We will also continue the evolution into more application awareness. Cilium already provides socket-based load balancing. We will continue down this path and provide things like intra-pod network policies to improve the security and continue to evolve socket-to-socket -socket networking, which which is particularly important for sidecar-based service mesh architectures. We have heard about this from MassMobile yesterday in order to scale Istio properly. However, most importantly, you will see Cilium unlock another giant leap in security by bringing what we have applied to networking, by combining networking and system call awareness to the runtime security world. We have heard from KP yesterday how Google is investing into an eBPF-based LSM for runtime security. Personally, I think the strict borders between network security and runtime security will go away, and a solution with mutual awareness and more context will fundamentally improve the security model. And then obviously it sounds a bit boring, but focus on metal and virtual machine workloads will be vital in 2021 and beyond, as we see more and more users migrate to Kubernetes. Connectivity to and from existing data centers, multiple cloud providers, and bridging virtualized workloads that are hard to migrate with modern containerized workloads will be a big focus. Finally, Cilium already provides a lot of service mesh functionality, which is no surprise. We all share the same desire to provide connectivity, security, and visibility for cloud native workloads. The major difference will be that Cilium can provide the same with very efficient, low cost, and fully transparent means by integrating service mesh concepts directly into the Linux operating system using eBPF. Concluding all of this, I think we will see a massive adoption of eBPF in the cloud native world. You will see more eBPF at the edge with load balancing that includes visibility and security concepts already known in the Kubernetes world. In Kubernetes, at the networking, um, service connectivity, network policy, and at the multi-cluster level. A lot of this is already reality with the Cilium CNI. We'll see massively improved observability. Um, we have heard about this. We have heard about many tracing examples throughout the summit. A lot of this will come to Kubernetes as well. eBPF will bring value to VM and metal fleets by connecting them to Kubernetes in a identity-aware way 
and by allowing VM and metal workloads to be represented in Kubernetes environments. Finally, on the host, eBPF will melt runtime and network security together. Why should we have fundamentally, why should we have fundamentally differences between APIs and system calls? They can both do harm. Last but not least, eBPF will obviously continue to redefine application profiling, tracing, and system troubleshooting on the host. With this, I'm looking into a very bright future with eBPF uh, for networking and security and open it up for questions. I quickly have to check in the Slack channel where the thread is. I have a CF first question from Nico. Does T proxy support mean Istio sidecars can have a fully BPF, a full BPF data path in Cilium 1.9? Uh, we are almost there, and there is a Istio upstream issue which is talking about and designing BPF native uh, sidecar injection. Uh, T proxy can be one building block of this, but T proxy does require privileges, so it may not be the best solution for Istio. We, however, we will provide a BPF based sidecar um, injection strategy for Istio in the near future. Second question, Julius. Would you say that eBPF for networking as code could completely replace the use of OVS and provide greater performance uh, or simplicity? Any disadvantages that you can think of with this potential switch? Um, great question. Um, I can't think of any disadvantages and I think that's a bit natural because many of us have actually worked on OVS in our past and we're all very proud of what we have built with OVS. I see eBPF-based solutions and Cilium as a natural evolution on, on, on top of something like OVS. It, it, it inherits the programmability aspect, but goes even further in terms of programmability and obviously is, is built for um, Kubernetes and cloud native worlds. Then I see a question, what is the future of BPF outside of Kubernetes? So from a Cilium perspective, we have, we have focused a lot on Kubernetes early on, but none of what we have built is very Kubernetes specific. Um, in the next release, or in, actually in 1.9, which is what we will release in just a bit, we will um, release a new agent mode that will allow Cilium to run on VMs and, agent, on VMs and metal um, machines, and thus embed these machines into your Kubernetes environment. Going forward, we might actually also support uh, running in a hypervisor mode. Um, so I think as we go further, we will, we will expand more and more into uh, the space outside of Kubernetes. What was important to us from the beginning is that from a design perspective, we are Kubernetes and cloud native first, and then we expand into different, into, into different uh, worlds. I see Ram Raimundo is asking, this will be a hybrid of SDN LO level from VMs, or will there be a hypervisor? I'm not sure I fully understand this question. Ramon, you may have to clarify that a little bit. So I will go to Mars's question. A lot of telco applications depend on availability of DPDK, SRIOV for network performance and networking. It's the most difficult block when migrating from VNFs to CNFs. Can you talk more about Cilium usage for specialized workloads in telco or finance roles? Um, yes, I can talk to this. We are working with, with several telcos right now to uh, enable what we will call workloads that require network access directly, uh, in particular in combination with SRIOE. We will be releasing this work um, over the next couple of months. So definitely chat with us um, if you have interest in this. There's nothing public right now, but we are happy to, to include you in the discussions we have. And I think we're slowly running out of time. So, we will, I think, go into a break. Yes. So thanks a lot, everybody, for listening to my, to my talk. Um, we'll take a quick break, and we will continue in five minutes.
All right. If you've just joined and the stream has been silent for a bit, I have to take a quick bio break. Um, we're currently taking a break. We'll be continuing with the lightning talks in about three minutes. And we have another EBPF summit, EBPF summit community poll. What futuristic EBPF use case would you most like to see at the next EBPF summit? Driving a car with EBPF presented by Tesla. <laughs> An EBPF compiler written EBPF. EBPF being used on spaceships. I guess that's also uh, re related to Elon. Uh, EBPF powered deep learning and blockchain on crypto mining drones. I'm pretty sure that already exists. Robot wars powered by EBPF. That might actually be interesting. Uh, I have an idea below, so let's have a look at that thread. I want an EBPF internet child for, filter for my Android phone. Very good idea. An interesting topic would be live kernel modifications. Uh, Florian is saying this besides the networking topic to mitigate vulner vulnerabilities. Yes, absolutely. I think that's a great topic for the next summit. All right, we have about one minute to go before we uh, kick off the lightning talks. If you have joined the stream for the, live for the lightning talks and you haven't joined Slack yet, uh, point your browser to ebpfio slash Slack to join the Slack channel and chat with everybody else. I see that Dan has just joined. Hi, Dan. Jorge is asking, is there any current approach to use both eBPF and machine learning? And Quentin is giving a pointer. Interesting. All right, I think it is time to continue with the lightning talks. Welcome back, everybody. Get settled in. We are now starting the lightning talks. If you have been on the stream yesterday, it will work exactly the same way. We will have lightning talks with, uh, with five minutes each in order to, to um, uh, minimize the, the time it takes overall. We will do the Q&A of all lightning talks in the Slack channel. So if you have questions for, this, for the lightning talk speakers, ask them directly in the Slack channels. All of the lightning talk speakers should be in the Slack channel, ebpf-summit and they will be answering there. And I'm super excited for the first one, um, which, is, which will be given by Julia Frascaria. Can eBPF save us from the data deluge? She is working or she's attending, I'm not sure whether she's working there or attending from the University of Amsterdam. Take it away, Julia. Hello everyone, welcome to the talk, can eBPF save us from the data deluge? Uh, I think first thing that I need to clarify is what I mean by data deluge and I believe it's pretty simple and I'm just talking about big data, which is a trend that is all over the industry, all over cloud computing and it actually only becomes a problem and as in data deluge the moment we actually put it in context in modern data centers. So let's jump straight in and look at what actually is happening in data centers. So usually we have compute nodes and storage nodes and data is transferred to and from these two node types over the network. The problem is that now on top of that, we have modern storage, which wouldn't be that much of a problem given that it improves the performance and the transfer and the throughput by a lot only it's maybe doing it a bit too much. So if we look at the throughput, we have that usually storage nodes can be comprised up to 64 SSDs. And this pro produces an aggregate throughput of 128 gigabytes per second, whereas the network with 16 lane PCIe interfaces usually accommodates 16 gigabytes per second of transfer. So we have a throughput gap and the data that the storage nodes produce is higher than what the network can accommodate. And this is what we call data movement wall. So it's something that we should try to solve and what I actually tried to solve with my research group and with my research in particular, focusing on storage. 
And I tried to solve it with eBPF, which is why I'm here at the stock. Um, so what I did is applying some principles of eBPF usage for storage this time. And in order to understand how, I think we need to take a step back and look at eBPF and denial of service. eBPF is used in this scenario, so and specifically let's focus on the compute node. Um, denial of service is when the nodes get overloaded from the network with too much traffic to handle, so we they would stall if only eBPF couldn't be placed, for example, very early on close to the network interface card to prevent the packets from reaching even the compute nodes and stalling everything. Well, in a very roundabout way, what is happening on the storage nodes is pretty much the same. So it's a denial of service only in reverse where the network is being overloaded by just too much data being produced uh, from the storage node, which is has a very high throughput. And the question that I tried to answer was, is there a way to actually put a stop here, just like eBPF was doing it on the other way around for denial of service attacks? Well, the answer is, it, it depends. So denial of services, uh, a service attacks, first of all, are malicious, whereas data transfers from storage nodes to compute nodes are not. They are business critical for the companies that are doing the transfer. So we cannot blindly drop the packets in the way we drop the packets in denial of service. So we need to do something different, but is there a way for eBPF to help us reduce the data transfer? Well, there probably is, because I, for example, implemented a prototype in the eBPF filter reduce interface that is placed instead of on the network interface card, which is what eBPF is placed uh, on, to prevent denial of service attacks. I placed it as close as possible to the storage to intercept the data transfer and allow users to implement their own operations. Like for example, only select the data that is greater than five and compute the max, or only select the data that is equal to five and count. So we reduce the size because at the end, we only have a numerical result and the input could potentially be gigabytes of data. This is a prototype, it's available on GitHub, and it, I think it is promising, but it's not there yet uh, as a thing that is ready for production, because eBPFs right now for storage does not really have the same, com the same powers that it has in the networking stack as far as it goes for packet modification, inspection, and dropping. So I had to modify the kernel for that, and it's not ideal, of course, and I could only go that far with the standard, with the current, interface and support of the infrastructure. But I do believe that uh, this is a promising direction. And in fact, during my research, I found that a lot of the in industry and blog posts and development that is going on in eBPF is actually in the direction of allowing users to push a bit more programmability into the kernel using eBPF, which is such a solid interface for, for doing that. So. I would be interested in the Q and A right now to um, to actually hear what you what your opinions are on this and if uh, data transfer and storage could potentially be the next step for eBPF in this um, in the current data center infrastructure. Amazing talk, Julia! I was super excited about this. Uh, I, I hope we can connect you to all the relevant people in the in the Slack channel so we can get that conversation going. I never thought about this, but it actually makes a ton of sense. Um, so I, I definitely want to to uh, to know how this will proceed. Next up in the lightning talk uh, session is Timo Reimann uh, from Digital Ocean, and Timo will talk about managed Kubernetes to app platform, one and a half years of selling usage at Digital Ocean. Hi there, my name is Timo Reimann. I'm a software engineer working at DigitalOcean. And today I'd like to talk about how we've been using Cilium over the last 1.5 years. So just to start off with some history and some context, I'm on the team responsible for our managed Kubernetes offering, or in short, the OKS. We started out using Flannel, but pretty quickly decided to move to another CNI provider because we weren't super happy with it. And in late 2018, we made the move 
or the switch to Cilium for a number of reasons that I wanted to mention quickly. One was the um, support for network policies, which we wanted to offer to our customers and to use internally. Um, we wanted to have a feature-rich CNI implementation, which we think Cilium definitely is. Um, Cilium is a very actively maintained project, so it's guaranteed to see frequent releases for new features and bug fixes. And we found the community to be super healthy and supportive. We try to be part of it and to give back periodically in terms of feedback and uh, uh, contributions every now and then. So today, all of our 10,000 DOKS clusters are running on Cilium exclusively. This is how we embed Cilium in the DOKS architecture. I think it's a fairly common, straightforward way of uh, setting it up. We have Cilium agents running on each of the worker nodes. We have Cilium operator running on some of the worker nodes, today in HA mode. We have another Cilium agent running on the control plane, and that is to enable connectivity between the control plane services and the data plane parts. And we use the existing etcd cluster that comes with every Kubernetes cluster to also maintain the state that Cilium needs to maintain, which has been working quite well for us. Yeah, speaking of, what's, what's our experience with Cilium bin? I think it's, it's been pretty good overall. We found it reasonably easy to maintain from an operational perspective. Um, just to give a more user-facing number, we have around 3.5% of DOKS clusters where customers use Cilium or native network policies directly. Upgrades have been fairly smooth. We moved from initially Cilium 1.4 to 1.8 today. Um, one thing we started to be more careful about is to retain the old RBAC rules as we make upgrades. We do rolling upgrades, so there's a period of time in every cluster's upgrade lifecycle where both the old and the new Cilium nodes are running, or parts are running concurrently, and we need to make sure that the old ones continue to have API um, accessibility or access. We found the health checking tools that Cilium offers really helpful, like Cilium status and readiness probes. Those were really um, good to, to debug and to troubleshoot network related issues. We have some adoptions planned or coming up. One is to move away from VXLAN to direct routing, which we can now do thanks to improvements to our VPC product. It's still a challenge for us to find a way to offer upgrades or changes to the mode without disruptions for clusters. That's something we continue to work on. We want to move away from using Kube proxy natively to EPPF, Kube proxy replacement, to reduce the amount of IP table rules we need to take care of. And we, look, we want to look more into Hubble to improve our observability story. App Platform is another product at DO that leverages Cilium indirectly. It's a push to deploy pass offering by DO, and it's built on top of DOKS entirely in a multi-tenancy fashion, which means we need to make sure that tenants um, cannot step on each other's toe, like provide proper isolation guarantees, and one key element here for us is the usage of Cilium network policies. We use those to restrict connectivity between the individual apps to ensure that we only allow ingress traffic from our own Envoy deployment to disallow certain protocols on the egress side like SMTP and to ensure connectivity to necessary infrastructure services like DNS and between our own management services running on each DOKS cluster. So yeah, in general, Cilium has been pretty great. We do have a tiny, bit of, a tiny bit of wish list we'd love to see Cilium offer. One is the ability to offer port ranges when defining uh, rules. We currently use IP tables to do traffic shaping. Um, we think that might be a good fit to be covered by Cilium as well. And we have a need to, do, um, to monitor and track connections in specific TCP states only, which is like the initial SYN ACK um, flag set and the final fin flag, but that's not possible today. So that's all I had. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Goodbye. Thanks a lot, Timo. Always great to hear from users and uh, in particular interested in that wish list. Uh, let's definitely catch up after the summit to make sure that we understand those and can bake those into the roadmap going forward. Next, next up is Sane Oscar from Pixie. And Sane will be talking about debugging Go in production using eBPF. Today, we're going to talk about debugging Go in production using eBPF. 
So before we get started, a little bit about me. I'm Zane, the co-founder and CEO of Pixie, along with being an adjunct professor of CS at Stanford. Uh, in the past, I worked on both machine learning and systems work, and today we're going to talk specifically about using eBPF to debug Go applications. So what is the developer problem we're looking at? So when you're an application developer and your program is misbehaving, you know, typically you just go look at your logs and see what's going on. And a lot of times the logs are just not in the spot that you need them. And what you wind up having to do is, you know, if you would just want to see where some variable is when it's getting called, you typically go in there, add the log, recompile and redeploy your application and get the results that you want. So let's take a look at a simple test application to see how this, this might work. So here's like an, a, a very simple function called compute E, which actually, you know, you don't have to worry about the details, but basically it tries to compute the value of E based on the number of iterations and it does an approximation. So we wrap this with an HTTP endpoint on slash E and you pass in a key called iters with a number of iterations. And like I said, this is just a small part of the code just so we can understand um, how, how this is going to work. So, you know, what if we find some problem and we really want to know how many iterations this function function ran for? What you typically do is go stick a printf in here and say, okay, these are the number of iterations and it was associated with this, this request. But what do you do if the code's already running and you don't really want to go and recompile and redeploy the application? So you have, you have a few options, right? The first one is you just go ahead and, and deal with it, recompile and redeploy. The other options are using things like uh, a debugger or something that, that can stop the code and may not be safe to use in production. Another option we're going to look at today, uh, considering we're in the eBPF summit, is actually using, using eBPF to, to do this. So what are we going to build? So we have our application running. We're going to try to write a BPF program that will basically hook into the application using uprobes. And that BPF program will write to a perf buffer, which will read with a separate binary called a tracer. And, you know, we don't have a lot of time, but we're going to try to build this uh, during, during this talk real quick. So diving into the details, you know, I just compiled the application and took a look at where Compute E is located. You can object thumbs a file to figure out where symbols are located in binaries. Um, there's a blog post on this, so feel free to reference that for more details because I'm going to go through it kind of fast. But basically, I find out an address for where Compute E is located. And what we're going to try to do is take the binary and then we're going to patch the binary using this thing, uh, uprobe hook in BPF, which will then execute some segment of a BPF program, which will write to a performance buffer that will read through the tracer binary. And you know, this is just typically how programs organize, and we ask the Linux kernel to basically insert a soft interrupt, which will run the, the BPF program. So what does that BPF program look like? It, you know, it's a pretty straightforward BPF program as far as BPF you know, programs are concerned. We declare a performance buffer, and we go read the, the location of the variable in, in the function. Uh, the key thing to remember here is that the registration is basically done using view probes, and it attaches to every running version of the binary. You can reference this GitHub link below for, for the actual code. So with that in mind, let's go look at a quick demo. So what I'm going to do over here is I already have the application compiled. I'm just going to run the application. And to show you how this typically looks, I'm going to curl it with one iteration. And you see it says the value of E is 2, which is wildly off. If I curl it at 100, it says it's 2.7183, which is, which is much closer to the actual value. Now, if you want to make sure we see what values are getting run, we can run uh, this tracer binary, which again is all available on GitHub for you to try out. We specify the application over here, and then we can curl it. Oops, sorry, forgot my password. And we can see that we picked up the value of iters as 100, or if I do 10, it'll say it's 10. If I go and delete iters, we can see the default value is 100. Cool. So going back over here, what we see is that we can utilize this thing called trace points and dynamic logging to go and instrument production code. Uh, since it doesn't actually stop the code, it can be, and it's relatively performant, you can do this as long as the, it's not in any tight loop of your application. Uh, one of the things we realize is that the complexities that go API, ABI do make this difficult to do. Um, so it is, it is a lot of work to actually get, get data this way. But you know, if you're motivated, you can do things like, you know, fairly complex things like capture HTTP messages. With that in mind, we can dump, go to a quick demo, run an HTTP tracer. And now when I curl this, you can actually see HTTP requests and the return codes and, and statuses. 
So jumping back over here, you know, thanks, thanks for attending the talk. You can uh, check out our open source examples and detailed blog posts about this. And also really want to call out some related projects we learned a lot from, which is, uh, you know, stuff from Kinwolk and, Kinwolk and Sysdig. Uh, thanks a lot. Awesome presentation. Thanks a lot, Sane. Uh, definitely not a great example on how far eBPF-based tracing is coming and awesome to see that uh, it will change how HTTP uh, tracing is possible as well. There were a couple of questions in the Slack channel, for example, what is the minimal kernel version? Sane already answered 414. If you have more questions for Sane, there is a Slack thread where you can ask Sane questions and he will uh, answer them right away. Coming up next is a talk about North Faust load balancing of Kubernetes services with eBPF and XTP, and will be given by Martinez Pumputis, a software engineer at Isovalent. Hello, my name is Martinez. I'm a Cilium developer working at Isovalent, and today I would like to give you a talk about how we implemented Kubernetes service load balancing with eBPF and XTP. So let's start with basics. First of all, Kubernetes is a distributed scheduler of pods, which are running applications. Pods can be grouped into so-called services, which can be accessed through Kubernetes load balancing mechanisms. Each Kubernetes node acts as a load balancer, meaning that the service can be accessed through any of them. When a client sends a request to a service, the node which receives the request has to select the service endpoint. If it's non-local endpoint, then it has to be redirected to a remote node. The reply from the remote node has to be passed to the intermediate node, and finally it can be redirected back to the client. Kubernetes implements the service load balancing with a bunch of IP tables rules. A packet sent to a service has to traverse each of them until a matching one is found. This not only increases latency, but also introduces problems with stability. Luckily with Cilium, we can replace the IP tables based solution. So Cilium, which is a Kubernetes networking and security plugin can install eBPF and XTP programs to each Kubernetes node. And this is a simplified version of the load balancing program. So instead of doing long list traversal of IP tables rules, the program does a single hash table lookup and to, in order to select the service and to select the, its endpoint. How does the program execution look from the Linux packet processing perspective? So first of all, we attach the PPF programs at two hook points. One is XTP and another one is TC ingress. So the program running at XFP selects the service endpoint. And if it selects the endpoint running on the remote node, then the packet is immediately redirected without even entering the networking stack. And if it selects the local endpoint, then the program running at the TC ingress will redirect the packet directly into the pods network namespace completely bypassing the upper stack. As you can see, we have less moving parts. So it means improvements in performance and reliability. Okay, so as my colleague has said, eBPF is not only about speed. With eBPF, we can create custom data planes, which functionality is not restricted by the existing features of Linux networking. So for example, in Cilium, we implemented direct server return with eBPF. So when the intermediate node is about to forward the request to the intermediate, to the destination node, the intermediate node appends some metadata to the packet so that destination node can send the reply directly to the client. This saves an extra hop and also preserves the client IP. Another example is consistent hashing. 
So with Cilium, we have implemented the maglev algorithm, which means that when the intermediate node, which previously served client requests goes down, another node will be able to select the same endpoints, meaning that no open connections will be disrupted. So finally, you might ask, how does it perform? The short answer, it performs really well. So from the benchmark, from the plot, which shows the performance of service handling at the intermediate node, we can see that XDP, NTC, Ingress, eBPF-based solutions both outperform IP tables and IPVS ones. And also that the XDP program was able to max out the client requests. So that was it. Thanks for your attention and time for questions. Thank you, Martinez. Always great to see burning servers. Definitely one way to get to serverless, I guess. And actually, Dale Hamill was uh, proposing that we do a drinking game every time somebody smacks IP tables. So I guess we'll all have to take a drink right now. Uh, if you have questions for Martinez, he's in the Slack channel. So feel free to ask him questions. He's ready to answer them as well. Next up is Luan Guimares. I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name. He is working for Wildlife Studios and will be talking about building a global gaming infrastructure with Cilium and eBPF. Hello, my name is Luan and I've been working at Wildlife for the past two years, maintaining a global game infrastructure using Kubernetes, Cilium, and other amazing tools that supports millions of daily active users playing our online games. And I'm here to talk about why we have chosen Cilium and eBPF and how it has become one of the most important parts of our architecture. Uh, so in the end of 2018, we started the preparations for two big game launches planned to be released in the middle of uh, 2019. One of the most important things to do was to rethink our Kubernetes networking model in order to support better integration between workloads in different AWS regions, which was really important for our microservices. And the CNI plugin that we were using that time didn't support pod to pod communication. So we were exposing services through internal load balancers and connecting parts of our internal game architecture using NATs. To understand why we needed pod to pod communication, I'm gonna show you two different systems we use for creating our games. The first one is called Pitaya. Pitaya is a lightweight game server framework used to build several components of each game. These components use a centralized ETCD cluster for auto discovery. Therefore, they can communicate with each other in two different ways, through NATS topics or a more performatic method relying on gRPC. And the other system is called Maestro. Uh, Maestro is a game room scheduler for Kubernetes, which is responsible for scaling up and down different stacks of game rooms on demand making sure that we always have game rooms available for new matches. So in order to reduce latency and improve the user experience, our stacks are deployed in several regions around the world. This also creates a fault tolerant system where it's possible to turn off game rooms in specific regions and redirect users to another point of the globe for a while. So let's talk about our old infrastructure and problems we had. It was really hard to configure routing for pod-to-pod -pod communication in an easy way in order to enable Pitaya's gRPC integration in multiple clusters. It was also hard in terms of scalability because for each shared service like TCD, NATS or Jaeger, um, and so on, we had to maintain internal load balancers and their respective DNS records. And we were, of course, looking for a tool that could improve the visibility of our network uh, without adding tons of specialized components to our clusters. Um, the big question was, how 
can we create and monitor a highly available global networking for critical game components that need to reach each other and also communicate with some centralized shared services like a TCD, for example. Uh, as the existing clusters were deployed using COPS, some different supported CNI plugins appeared as good candidates to meet the requirements. So we ran several tests against the available options comparing from the setup complexity to the networking performance. And after analyzing Cilium's positive results, uh, like the stability running hundreds of nodes and the small amount of requests to Kubernetes API, we came up with a plan to roll out Cilium for all the production clusters. Um, the migration process was really challenging and it took months of work. Thanks to the good documentation and the amazing support of the Cilium community, we could easily configure the cluster mesh feature, making it possible to enable the gRPC mode on Pitaya. The pod-to-pod -pod communication improved the server's performance and removed one of those single points of failure, which was NATS. And in a second migration around, we replaced most of the internal load balances we had for Cilium Global Services. This process included the migration of those load balancers attached to Pitaya's ETCD and to internal logging and tracing stacks, for example. And these removed the complexity of maintaining a lot of cloud scoped load balancers for internal usage and their respective private DNS records. This is how it looks after the migration. The game rooms and other game components talk to each other using cluster mesh VXLAN layer. And here you can also see the global service to reach ETCD. So today we have Cilium deployed in almost 30 Kubernetes production clusters. Each game has at least three clusters running together in the same cluster mesh configuration. This infrastructure handles more than 50,000 clients requests per second and supports millions of daily active users. Uh, since the migration, we've been working with the Cilium team to improve our systems. This close interaction in supported in in a good way, some investigations and allowed us to solve problems together, increasing the reliability of our network. Now we are looking forward to improve the security of our environment with the powers of network policies toward the Zero Trust Network Initiative. And another promising tool is Hubble that we already tested in a few clusters. Now we are very excited to roll out this tool for all the production environments to obtain detailed insights about our network with minimum overhead thanks to the use of eBPF. So this is how we are using Cilium at Wildlife. And if you want to know more about the story behind this journey, you can check the post I published on the Cilium blog on September 3rd the telling everything about it um, that's it thanks hope you enjoyed folks thank you very much Luan. awesome story um and i want to give the shout out just back at you it's been awesome to work with you and the team over the last couple of years uh, you have been influential in various in various selling features that we have built um awesome team uh, definitely check out the blog post as well you can find it on Selim io slash blog it has been posted i think a couple of months ago and it has all the details even down to configuration snippets and stuff like that how to configure cluster mesh and so on and details kind of the selection process as well why ebpf made a difference for wildlife studios next up is romiro bereletta uh, from octeto um, and we will hear a story about falco the tale of Smokey and the crypto bandits Hi everyone. Today I'm going to talk about how Octeto uses Falco to keep our users happy and our platform healthy. My name is Ramiro. I'm one of the co-founders of Octeto. 
Before Octeto, I used to be an architect at Atlassian and a software engineer at Azure. If you want to reach out to me after the conference, you can find me on Twitter as at Arborless. So what is Octeto? Octeto is a dev platform powered by Kubernetes. With Octeto, you can go from source to deploy in one click on any language or stack. Uh, when a developer creates an account on Octeto, they get a namespace where they can run anything they want. So a few months ago, we woke up and saw this in our dashboard. And I'm going to lie, we were excited. We saw, yes, expo exponential growth. This is what we want. But then we saw this. What happened was that a group of um, crypto aficionados found about Octeto and decided to use it to start running uh, a bunch of like, to mi start mining a bunch of crypto coin. And it's something that GCP was not really happy about it. And they reached out to us and asked us to you know, put it under control. So for the first few days, we're doing it manually. We're logging in, seeing what's going on. But it was not a scale at all. But we did some research, talked to some of our friends, and ended up finding Falco. And it looked like just the tool we needed. So we went ahead, we installed Falco in our Kubernetes clusters. We configured the default rules, add a few more based on what we've seen so far, and started to send notifications to Slack. We started, and after a few hours, boom, our clusters were down. We logged in. We had to like roll everything back and get it under control. Then we went through the logs. We had a postmortem, and what happened? Well, what happened was the default rules of Falco were not that well suited for a dev platform. A lot of things you, Falco doesn't let you to do, or notifies you about are things developers do a lot, like doing an exec on a pod, changing the content of a, of a container. That's something with Octero is part of that play. That didn't really work out. Second, we realized that all this rule processing was non-trivial. It was putting a big uh, hit on the CPU consumption of every node. And finally, it's kind of the biggest surprise for us, is that Falco's eBPF module didn't play along that well with Container OS, which is the default OS for Kubernetes clusters on GCP. So we got the team together. We talk about what happened. We look at the logs. We kind of ask around. So we build. We learn what, go what happened. And we make some adjustments. I'm not going to bore you with everything we did to get where we are today. We're going to jump ahead to what we're doing today. So today, we are still running Falco on all of our clusters. What we did is we built a tool to automatically reload Falco whenever a set of rules changes. These rules are, are stored on a GitHub repo, and Falco will just automatically reload them when they detect change. This is so that we can be more dynamic as we adjust our rules and not have to go through a full redeploy cycle every time. So what we ended up doing is we are using Falco to monitor when a process connects to a certain list of IPs, when there are certain binaries running, or when a user performs certain especially cluster-wide actions that tend to be malicious. For IPs in particular, we found there's a lot of prior art on you know, lists of IPs of, of the of well-known um, cryptocurrency networks. We just took those. We have a cron job that takes those lists, converts them into Falco rules, puts them on this repo, and then Falco just reloads. So this allows us to go to be very agile when we need to make some changes or we need to like, ban some IPs. And then we send all of the notifications to Slack where a human analyzes the data and decided whether to ban or not. And finally, for now, we are using Ubuntu instead of container OS because we've been seeing much better performance on Falco. And we're quite happy with the result. It's not perfect, but it has allowed us to, one, cut down on those ugly GCP notifications, and we don't have as much malicious use as before. So as I said before, we're building this, we are learning from this, and we're adjusting. And there's something key as you adopt something like Falco. Not a job you do once and you're done. You have to keep you know, iterating, adjusting, learning from what you're doing, and, and improving over time. So for us, the future looks like this. We, want, we do want to move to EPF module. We have to figure out uh, how to improve the performance, because we want to reduce our OS footprint. We want to run with a small OS. We're going to have to build some more smarter rules based on behavior. We are analyzing how our, uh, our users use Octeto to make sure that we don't block the bad, we block the bad guys, but not the good guys. And we want to invest more in automatic automatic the response of malicious actions rather than requiring a human. And this is where we are today. Uh, thanks for listening. And if this is something that you're interested in or want to share some of your own experiences, please reach out to me at the Slack on the conference or on Twitter.
Enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye. Thanks a lot, Ramiro. All, always great to hear user stories. This one on Falco. I'm sure many of you are interested in the actual Falco rules that uh, Ramiro is using. You can find him in the Slack uh, thread that Joe has created, and Ramiro is ready to answer questions there. We have another user talk coming up next uh, from Vlad Ungureanu from Palantir. And Vlad will be talking about past, present, and future of Cilium and Hubble at Palantir Technologies. Take it away, Vlad. Hello, my name is Vlad and I'm a software engineer at Palantir Technologies. To give you a brief intro on Palantir, we were founded uh, 16 years ago. And uh, since our inception, uh, the main purpose of the company is to solve the hardest data problems of the world's most important uh, organizations. Uh, here are some quick examples of what we do. Palantir is used for cyber defense uh, for larger institutions and nation states. Our software is used in support of anti-terror missions in the West, uh, intel gathering, and also mission planning in the field. Ferrari also uses Palantir to make F1 cars faster and more efficient. In 2017, we decided to build our next generation cloud computing platform. We called it Rubix, and we made the decision to use Kate as the foundational building block for, uh, for it. The main type of workloads that we run on Rubix are Apache Spark. One of the key features of Rubix is that uh, every machine has a lifetime of uh, maximum 48 hours. This brings two advantages. Uh, first one is faster patching um, for CVs. You deploy a new machine image uh, to the fleet and in 48 hours, you know that the CV has been patched. The second one is resistance to advance uh, persistent threats. If an attacker compromises a machine, it will have 48 hours to, um, uh, uh, to do any bad things. And then uh, the machine will, uh, will die away. Uh, this behavior uh, can be easily detected by our InfoSec team if the attacker continues uh, over and over again to breach machines. In 2019, we gave a talk at uh, KubeCon Europe, and since then, Rubix expand, expanded in four more Amazon regions. We doubled the number of Kate's nodes that were running across the fleet to 5,000. Also, uh, per day, uh, we destroy and rebuild almost 40,000 instances. And also during a day, uh, it's not uncommon for us to run uh, 1.4 million pods. Uh, in 2017, when the project started, we were running Calico in uh, overlay mode. Uh, we uh, found that Calico is not uh, suited for our type of workload. So we're looking to swap something else. Uh, in 2018, when Lyft released their IPVLAN uh, native VPC routing CNI plugin, we decided to migrate to it. Uh, Migrating uh, to it uh, went fairly smooth, uh, but uh, it opened uh, two, uh, two main problems. First one was uh, the lack of firewalling in the Lyft uh, CNI plugin. And the second one was that uh, every machine had to call the Amazon API to attach uh, ENIs and IPs, uh, which caused severe rate limitings on, uh, on, on, the, on the EC2 API side. Uh, to solve the firewalling problem, we decided to build an in-house solution based on IP tables. Um, the implementation wasn't, uh, wasn't good enough. The main reason is it didn't support uh, DNS filtering. So at that point in time, we decided to look in the open source community to use something off the shelf. Uh, so in early 2019, we discovered Cilium uh, and we decided to transition to it. Realizing the benefits of the native uh, VPC routing, we worked together with the Cilium team to build the Amazon ENI IPAM integration in the Cilium operator. As of late 2019, all our production workloads are now running Cilium with the Amazon ENI IPAM, and also we're running uh, level three, level four, and DNS, DNS based policy in enforcement mode. As the security of uh, of the network evolved, we have to we had to evolve the observability of it uh, as well. To do so, we decided to install Hubble. Uh, in the past, we were able to observe uh, uh, network flows just at the edge, but now with Hubble, we're able to get uh, network flow observability at the host level. Uh, our CERT team gets a lot of mileage from Hubble in two main areas. First one is observing the uh, DNS traffic, and the second one is uh, observing which uh, processes are doing exec, bind, and connect uh, system calls. So with these two things uh, in our tool belt, we can get an easy 360-degree 
traceability of network calls uh, associated to a Kubernetes pod. And then using Kate's audit logs, you're able to trace back to the platform user that, uh, that launched that pod. In the same security area, we have another challenge, which is uh, top of our mind. A lot of compute workloads that we run in the platform often run uh, untrusted uh, code that either be written by a data scientist or uh, code that is written to train a uh, machine learning uh, model. These workloads usually retrieve data from, from, from place, they process it locally, and then they upload it back. Uh, to do so, they need some sort of authentication material in their API requests. Uh, given that we do not control the code that operates on, uh, on the data, uh, we don't really want uh, the code to have access to this authentication material. Uh, we want to start first by verifying that the authentic material is not tampered with. Uh, for this purpose, we're looking at using Cilium coupled with eBPF socket redirection to send the packets to Envoy and then Envoy to do the verification on its end. After that, strategically, we want to be in a place that we're able to swap the authentication material on the fly uh, using the, um, the same tools, raising the security bar even higher. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, questions will be over eBPF uh, Summit Slack channel. Thank you very much, Vlad. Uh, and definitely a quick shout out to Vlad. He's not only an awesome end user giving us lots of feedback, he has actually also contributed various features to Cilium and is part of the core team uh, of Cilium as well. I think uh, awesome to have you on the team, Vlad. And actually, I want to uh, give a quick uh, look into the questions of Gobin has, has asked, why, 20, uh, why 48 hours specifically, why not 24? And Vlad has, entered, uh, has answered, we choose 48 hours mostly because we have long running Spark jobs that can't execute that quick. So for jobs that need more than 48 hours runtime, we try to make them stash data and then retrieve it and continue processing. Awesome, definitely check out, uh, definitely talk to Vlad if you want to learn more about uh, use case. I think uh, probably one of our uh, extensive power users using a lot of the security functionality that eBPF brings uh, via Cilium. Next up, we have Itai Shakuri uh, from Aqua Security uh, talking about tracing and detecting malware using eBPF. Hi, my name is Itai Shakuri, and I work for Aqua Security on open source security tools. Specifically, I've been involved in a project called Tracy, which is a system and container tracer using eBPF. We've built Tracy as the engine for our dynamic container scanning offering, but Tracy itself is fully open source on GitHub with open contribution policy and the permissive license. In this talk, I wanted to show you how we can use Tracy to detect behavioral patterns of evasive malware. This is where malware will try to hide from being detected by simple scanners, but using eBPF and system tracing, we can still detect the behavioral signature of those evasion techniques. So the first example that I'm going to show is called fileless execution. This is where the malware will be executed, but it will never be persisted as a file on the disk. This technique is useful to avoid file system watchers or the traditional anti-malware scanners. And here I'm downloading the malware directly from the internet, but I'm not saving it to, into a file. I'm piping the binary data directly into another program, which will execute the streamed malware. This elf exec program does that by using the memfd create system call, which creates a file descriptor directly backed by a memory buffer without ever touching the disk. So to demonstrate, we first start Tracy, and then we will start the POC. So we can see that the, um, the flow of event and we can recognize the signature behavior as a typical fileless execution. We see the memfd create system call and connect to reach out to the internet. And we also see the final execve at, which actually executed the malware. This is how system tracing helps us detect the potential malware. But this could also have been achieved using other tools like S-Trace, for example, right? But because we are using eBPF, 
we can do more interesting things like tracing internal kernel functions and even capture the bytes of data as they are downloaded as forensic evidence for later investigation. If we take a look at the tracy output directory, we can see the capture file that was downloaded from the internet. So if we look at um, temp tracy, we see here this file, which is the binary data that was downloaded. This file is a reconstruction of the downloaded file by spying on the VFS write internal kernel function and copying each chunk of data as it is being written. <clears throat> the second example I'll show is a technique called memory packing. This is where a binary executable contains an embedded executable that is unpacked and executed at runtime. The beauty in this technique is that everything happens within the confines of the same process. So the bootstrapping process unpacks the embedded binary into its own virtual memory and yields execution. Therefore, there is no second exec VE syscall involved, like in the previous example. Skipping the exec VE call might trick simpler tracing tools, but if we learn the behavioral pattern, we can still detect memory packers. So again, we are going to start Tracy and the POC. <clears throat> And we can follow the chain of events and we can understand that the memory region is prepared to be used to run a program. This is indicated by the executable flag that is being uh, set. But again, Tracy can do even better. Because we are using eBPF and running our own code there, we can track the simple state machine in eBPF code and automatically alert when we detect this signature, as you can see in these memprot alert events that are generated by Tracy. If we check uh, the Tracy output directory again, we see that Tracy has also captured the forensic evidence. In this case, we take a look at the same directory. This bin file is the evidence. This is, um, this is the precise memory region that triggered the alert. And this is how uh, we were able to do that thanks to the power of eBPF. So that was my very quick share. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we are looking forward for your involvement. So if you are interested, reach out via GitHub discussions or GitHub issues. We're under aqua security slash Tracy or find me directly on Twitter to discuss. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Itai, and apologies, everybody, for not hiding my video quickly enough. I didn't notice for a second. I hope it didn't cause too much uh, inconvenience. Awesome introduction into Tracy. Definitely check it out. It's open source. You can find it on GitHub. And I think there's also a pull request open to add it to the list of projects on the eBPF.io website. Um, I think Itai is on the Slack. Yes, I can see him. So if you have questions, go ahead and ask him in the Slack channel. Next in line is Natalia Ivanko. Uh, Natalia is a uh, security engineer working for iSurveillance, and she will be talking about identity aware threat detection and network monitoring by using eBPF. Please welcome Natalia. Hey, my name is Natalia Ivanko, and I work as a security engineer for iSurveillance. So probably you have already seen a couple of use cases, how one can use eBPF for uh, network policy logging or for measuring CPU overhead. But today I would like to talk about how a security team or a security operations team could use eBPF and the data exactly be eBPF for network monitoring and threat detection in cloud native environments. So for example, in Kubernetes. We will see a couple of examples how a security team could detect malicious inbound and outbound connections. So for example, how a security engineer could detect an external connection to a suspicious IP, or how can a security team could monitor all the inbound connections to workloads, or monitor which kind of workloads are accessing the KYTS API server. So a little bit about the background. 
The traditional network monitoring tools are based on IPs and ports, and they are not really effective on cloud-native environments like in Kubernetes, where the workloads are basically containerized and bundled together, and the IPs are frequently changing. So the IPs and ports are not meaningful there anymore. And one of the solutions could be using EPPF and Cilium to grab this data from the kernel, ship it to Splunk, and then define signatures to detect these connections and basically create an alert. So as an example, I already have a GKE cluster set up. It's called EBPF Lab Summit, and I already have an example application. It's the Gasbook application from Kubernetes. It's a page level application with a Redis backend to store the entries. I can write like, hey, and then we see it's working and it's running on the default namespace. You can see the pods here. So the first example, I'm going to show you how a security team could detect a malicious connection to an external IP. Um, so let's assume that the front end pod got compromised because of an outdated PHP version and suddenly there is a crypto miner running on it. Um, I'm not going to demo the real attack, I'm going to generate the traffic by hand with curl. So I already have the command set up here. I'm just going to exec into the pod. We are in the pod now, and then I'm going to generate some traffic by hand. Um, yeah, it's a curl against a monero mining pool. I already looked that up before. And now um, I already have EBPF um, and Cilium running on the cluster. And if I go to Splunk and use a signature that I predefined previously, I should be able to see the traffic coming from that pod. So here we go. Basically, on the left hand side, you can see the source. And then on the right hand side, basically, you can see the destination. So here we can see that there is the front end source pod running on the default namespace with the following Kubernetes labels. And then on the right hand side, you can see that hey, there was a connection to this like Monero mining pool. And then basically we can also see that the network policy decision was first dropped and then forwarded. And I forgot to mention that I also applied a Cilium network policy here, which allowed me to detect all the L7 layer visibility here. I can show it to you later on the Slack channel. So basically with this signature, we can see all the outbound connections going from the front end pod. And on the other hand, we can also detect inbound connections to unexpected workloads. So for example, I might all the inbound connections and detect when there, there was a malicious connection to one of the workloads. This can happen when, for example, a Kubernetes service left unexposed uh, unintentionally. So for example, here we have the guestbook application. I have the front end pod exposed by a service. So I can reach it via curl from my local machine. This is the IP and I also looked it up before. So I'm just gonna do a couple of curl to generate some traffic. And with the following signatures, I already have it predefined. We could actually see all the incoming connections to the front end pod. Yeah, so here we have that um, the destination on the left hand side, this was the Gatsbook application, and then the network policy decisions, and basically the counts as well. And here I'm actually monitoring all the inbound connections. So uh, on the above, you can see a couple of other destinations and then a couple of counts. 
And then basically I just used reserved remote mode, which is basically um, given a Serum specific uh, entity for the remote nodes. So these two examples were a little bit more generic. We detected like a suspicious external connection and then basically we were monitoring all the inbound connections. The last example will be a little bit more specific. We will detect and monitor like which workloads are accessing the KYTS API service. So I already have the IP of the KYTS API server. I looked it up before. This is the IP. And I already mentioned that I applied a Cilium network policy to detect the ASNR layer visibility for in the first example. So first I'm just going to delete this network policy. And then, okay, it's deleted. And then exec into the front end pod and then generate some traffic to the KYTS API server. I'm just gonna do a couple of curves. Okay, this is not HTTPS, let's see. It hangs. Okay, so let's try it once more. I forgot that I actually have to add the dash minus K flag. Yeah, we are going to get 403 because it's unauthorized, but it's good for generating some traffic. And then basically with the following signature, we are going to monitor all the workloads which are accessing the KYTS API server. So if I go to Splunk and just insert the signature and go to search, I should be able to see which applications are accessing the API server. So here you can see basically the source, the namespace, the pod, you can see the front end, the DNS, the cube DNS, and then basically the Kubernetes labels, the network policy dishes, decisions that it was forwarded, and basically the destination IP and the destination port. And I hope it was useful and you could say that among many others, you could use eBPF and the data is directed with eBPF for network monitoring and threat detection in cloud native environments. And it's super powerful. You could see the source and the destination without any IPs and ports is basically based on namespace, pods and labels. And if you have any questions, uh, yeah, we can do a Q&A on this Slack channel. Just feel free to reach me out. And I hope you enjoyed it. See you soon. Thank you very much, Natalia. Awesome presentation showcasing how eBPF will really change security value uh, in, in Kubernetes, but also obviously outside of Kubernetes. If you have questions for Natalia, feel free to ask her in the Slack channel. Uh, she's available and happy to give you insights into how she has been using Splunk, for example, maybe give you uh, the filters and uh, examples she has been going through. Also, if you have noticed and uh, have actually checked out whether the HTTP endpoint she has been using in her demo, and if you have noticed that this one is public, you, I think you can officially call yourself a hacker right now. Um, for those of you who missed this opportunity, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Going further, next talk, William Finlay uh, from Carlton University, and we will going back into runtime security with KRSI. We will, William will be talking about BPF Box, a new project for simple, precise process confinement with eBPF traits with eBPF and KRSI. Take it away, William. I'm William Finley from Carleton University, and today I'll be talking about BPF Box and how it leverages the new kernel runtime security instrumentation feature in eBPF to implement process confinement. At a glance, BPF Box represents a new approach to process confinement under the Linux kernel, enabled by eBPF. Users write per application policy in a simple policy language, and policy is then loaded and enforced in the kernel using eBPF programs attached to LSM hooks. 
Our eBPF-based implementation enables the integration of both user space and kernel space system state with LSM layer enforcement. Our motivation for creating an eBPF-based process confinement mechanism was informed by the dual insight that there is room for improvement in the existing process confinement landscape, and that eBPF presents new opportunities for improving operating system security. Higher level process confinement mechanisms on Linux, such as Snap and Docker, are generally made up of a combination of multiple lower level techniques. The idea is that these techniques taken together can produce a complete solution. Often the policy is defined by writing high level package manifests for the application, which are then translated into the underlying policy mechanisms. Unfortunately, this typically results in policy that is easy to write, but difficult to audit and is often overly permissive in practice. Lower level frameworks such as SE Linux, AppArmor, and Tomoyo are often cited as being very difficult to use. These frameworks are designed to be used by security experts and are generally inaccessible to end users. We set out to see if we could do anything better by building something new. eBPF can change the way we look at operating system security by offering a fine-grained system introspection framework that can be used to integrate cross-layer system state with policy enforcement. Further, it enables rapid prototyping and safe deployment of kernel extensions, which can be integrated into a running kernel without the need to reboot. This culminates in an opportunity to rethink process confinement from the ground up. In user space, BPFbox runs as a privileged daemon that leverages the BCC framework for Python to compile and load its BPF programs into the kernel. All of BPFbox's kernel space components are written in eBPF and utilize several classes of BPF programs, such as LSM probes for policy enforcement, K probes for tracking kernel space state, and U probes for tracking user space state. In total, BPFbox consists of under 2,000 lines of kernel space code. Thanks to eBPF, BPFbox's implementation is lightweight, flexible, and production safe, and it works out of the box in any vanilla Linux kernel version 5.8 or higher. BPFbox policy at its core consists of a series of rules that can optionally be augmented by directives. Rules specify access to various system objects and generally take an identifier, such as a path name, to specify the object and one or more modes of access. Directives are used to augment blocks of rules and are written using a special syntax shown here. In general, directives can either be used to specify an action that should be taken in a group of rules, such as allow or deny, or to specify additional context for the group of rules. One of BPFbox's more unique features is its ability to augment policy with additional context. A special func directive is used to specify that a block of rules should only apply within a call to a given user space function. The kfunc directive does the same thing, but with a kernel function instead. In this example, we have a simplified profile for a login program. It's allowed to read Etsy password and Etsy shadow within a call to the check password function, and is allowed to read and append to shadow and password within a call to the add user function. In all other instances, these access patterns would be denied. We'd like to extend a special thank you to the original creators of eBPF, Alexei Starovoitov and Daniel Borkman, to KP Singh for creating the KRSI framework, and to my fellow BCC contributors for creating an awesome eBPF framework. BPFbox is free and open source software and is available at the link below. Thank you very much, William. Awesome project. Um, really looking forward to see this grow. Definitely do add this to the eBPF IO project list as well. I think it's definitely one of the projects that should be listed. I'm, I'm super excited how much we're hearing about runtime security today and also yesterday um, and how EBPF changes, how in particular if KRSI and EBPF based LSMs is changing uh, security on Linux. Give a round of applause to William and feel free to ask him questions in the Slack channel as well. Next up, exciting as well, we will be hearing from Lawrence Bauer. Lawrence is um, working at Cloudflare, and he will talk about how to shape BPF with your Go project. Please welcome Lawrence. Hi, I'm Lawrence. I work at Cloudflare, and in the next five minutes, I'll show you how you can ship a piece of BPF with a Go project. To do this, I'll build a very simple application 
and it'll, it's going to count the number of packets on the loopback interface. It'll print that number on the console and it will do all of that from a single Go binary that you can easily copy around and deploy to wherever you need it. I have prepared some code that I want to show you. There's some headers here. There's the C file with the eBPF, and then there's the main.go. And in the main.go, there's one function that's interesting, which is open raw sock. And all it does is create a raw socket, which is the same thing that TCP dump uses to capture traffic. We'll use the same magic to implement our little test program. The logic for that lives in counter.c. There's a map called packets, which stores the counter that I told you about. And there's a BPF program called count packets. And all that does is just whenever uh, it's executed, it'll bump the counter by one. And then afterwards it exits. So let me show you how to wire these two things up. And to do this, we're going to use go generate. Generate to run a tool that I wrote called BPF to go. And all that BPF to go need, uh, to, needs as arguments is a name, and here I'll use counter, and then the C file that you want to compile. And you can also pass some flags through to Clang, which BPF to go invokes. So here I'll add the include directory that I interested in or that I have in my example project here. And I'll also tell it to optimize the code for good measure. I'll save this. And then run generate. And as you can see, there's four files that came out of this. Um, there's two object files and these are generated via Clang. Um, and they contain the compiled BPF uh, and a bunch of other information. And BPF to go parses these object files to generate these Go files, which look like this. The first interesting struct is this thing called counter specs, which has an entry for each program that you've defined in your C file and an entry for each map that you've defined. Uh, you can see here there's this count packets program and the packets map. And the specs you can think of as a blueprint of your programs and your maps before you load them into the kernel. There's another interesting struct called counter objects. And that's the same thing just after we've loaded into the kernel. So here we have the program and the map as it is in the kernel and you can interact with it. Let's do some time travel into the future and pretend that I've just written all of this Go code. And the, the beginning here and the end are the same as before, but these here, this code is new. So let's walk through it. The first thing you'll do is get the blueprint that I mentioned earlier, these specs. Then you load them into the kernel and you get these objects where we do some cleanup on them and then create a raw socket on the loopback interface. Now we have all the ingredients for our, to actually make our program work. And this is the magic bit where we plug it all together and we attach the BPF to this program, or sorry, we attach program count packets to the socket via the syscall. And afterwards, we just have this loop that runs forever and every second it prints out the packets or the count of packets that we've seen. Let's give this a go. Yep, that worked. I can run the program. And the program does what I wanted to do after pinging. The example and the tooling that I used for this are both on GitHub, and I hope that they are useful for you as well.
Thank you very much, Lawrence. And Lawrence has already posted the uh, link to the Git repo with all of the code for the talk. Make sure to um, check it out. Give a round of applause to Lawrence. Next up is a talk by Yutaro Hayakawa, uh, talking about eBPF at Lines Private Cloud, another networking talk around load balancing. Hello, this is Yutaro Hayakawa from Line Corporation. Today, I'm going to talk about the very overview of how we use the eBPF in our private cloud infrastructure. I cannot introduce in detail, so I put many pointers in this slide. So if you have interested in, please visit the links. If you may don't you may don't know about the line, so let me explain it first. Line is a messaging service which is very popular in Asian countries like Japan, Taiwan, or Thailand. It provides a lot of family services around that messaging functionality, like video streaming, news media, music, and so on. We have approximately 185 million global monthly active users and over 3 terabits of network traffic in total. Many of the line services are running on a private cloud called Builder. It is based on OpenStack and provides the basic cloud functionality like computing, networking, storage, as well as the managed services like Elasticsearch, Kafka, Redis, or Kubernetes. Here is the place which eBPF comes in. Since about 2017, the very beginning of our service, we provide the XDP-based high-performance L4 load balancer service. It already has 5,100 private and 760 public VIPs and be deployed in three regions in global. The number of users are growing even for today. Uh, we are also developing the integration with other cloud components. For example, recently we have developed the integration with other, our managed Kubernetes service using Cloud Controller Manager. That means if users create their service with type load balancer, it uses the XDP load balancer as a backend. The very simplified service architecture looks like this. There is a user-facing API server. Users can configure their load balancer from dashboard or using API or indirectly use it through Kubernetes. Once the API server gets the request to deploy the load balancer, it configures the actual load balancer instances through RPC. Here we have VCC-based load balancer control plane, which is responsible for interacting with the API server and configure the XDP data plane through the BPF maps. Our data plane is inspired by many hyperscale architecture like Google, Microsoft, and Facebook. It uses IPIP-based L3DSO, Magrev hashing, or LRU map-based session caching, and so on. Here we don't have enough time to explain about the entire service architecture. For more information, we have a presentation that describes it in detail. Please check it out if you have interest in it. So let's go on to our next use case. The next one is a tool called IPF Trace, which we have developed recently. Uh, it is a domain specific function call tracer. It traces which functions have, sorry, which packets have gone through which functions inside the kernel. The usage is very simple. Mark the packet you wish to trace and pass the mark to the IPF trace, that's it. What you get is like this. What you see in the middle column are the functions that the packet have gone through. This trace is very useful to see how the packet have processed in the kernel. In addition to the function code trace, user, users can use, write the small script to correct the additional data from SKBuff with Lua. The information on the right-hand side is corrected by that script. This is very useful to see how the fields of SKBAFs are changed function by function. For example, here it tracks the GSO information. So how we use it? We use this to investigate the performance issue on the hypervisor in our next generation data center network architecture. It heavily utilizes the quite younger Linux kernel feature like SRV6 or VRF. We met the very weird performance degradations when we use the GSO together with this hypervisor network. We applied the IPF trace to investigate this issue and found there was a bug in the GSO handling in the SRV6. We got the dramatic performance gain in fixing this. We upstreamed the change and it's already the part of the mainline kernel. 
Again, we don't have much time, so here are the pointers to the detailed information. We have more and more ABPS tasks to talk. The, here we have another use case of XDB for SR Basics Data Plane installation and how we use the UDP and PathMT UD discovery in our low answer. We very quickly went through our ABPF use cases. If you have other questions, please feel free to contact me on Twitter or Slack. We are very happy to interact with the ABPF community. Thank you for listening. And now I'll take a question. Thank you, Yutaro. Awesome. I think another great example on how eBPF at the edge is changing load balancing. And I think awesome to see how we can all benefit from each other uh, by sharing what we are learning and how we solve the challenges of eBPF. I think that this might be the fifth load balancer uh, based on eBPF that we have heard about uh, during this summit. Please uh, please talk to Yutaro on Slack and please give him a, give him a warm welcome applause for, for the talk, very well done. We're slowly and slowly coming to the end of the Lightning Talk session. We have two more sessions to go. Next up is Dinesh Venkatesan from Microsoft. And uh, Dinesh will be talking about building a behavioral knowledge graph using eBPF. Hello, everyone. So uh, today we will talk about building a knowledge graph, a behavioral knowledge graph using the eBPF's um, observability capabilities. Why knowledge graph? Because with the proliferation of data and um, compute power, the answers are everywhere. The trick is asking right questions and knowledge graph fundamentally enables researchers to ask right questions when they analyze certain unknown samples. Knowledge graph is also good for handling complex data and it has a flexible schema and it automatically abstracts relationships between entities. And it is an excellent motivator for building causal inference uh, solutions. Let's take a quick anecdote of truth versus fact. Uh, when we say four plus two is equal to six, it is a fact, whereas the reverse is not a fact, but a truth because um, six can, equal, uh, can be equivalent to four plus two or seven minus one or eight minus two, uh, so on and so forth. So let's take a case study of uh, Mirai Botnet. Um, Mirai Botnet, um, out of the several techniques it deploys, one of the techniques is it generates a random alpha numerical string the very first time it gets executed and it overrides the ARGS pointer array, um, it, it overrides ARGS of zero value uh, so that the process name when enumerated by tools like PS or top command uh, gets subverted. However, uh, an analyst can go to uh, slash proc slash PAD and the status uh, file uh, to get the command line attribute and it would still reflect the original um, uh, name of the Mirai botnet when it was executed. In order to subvert that, Mirai, sub Mirai botnet subsequently calls PRCTL syscall with PR underscore set underscore name uh, with the same um, alpha numerical string that was randomly generated. So after this syscall is executed, the proc PID status file is also changed. And uh, <clears throat> the only, the, there are still ways like uh, analyst can enumerate proc PAD maps uh, to get the uh, loaded uh, map file, but that is beyond the scope of this particular uh, quick talk. So this is a simple POC code or part of the Mirai botnet code that actually um, showcases this functionality. And we will now use eBPF's um, all seeing capability to trace all the syscalls. As you could see here, uh, in this case, the Mirai also uh, embodies a ptrace um, function to see whether somebody is tracing it. So if you use um, fundamental tracing tools such as strace, the flow will break here and the Mirai will uh, escape from uh, executing further. So let's use eBPF to trace all the syscalls and log them as triplets and consume them uh, with free open source uh, graph database such as Kale 
or Neo4j. And then uh, we will also, also, we can also use um, Neo4j graph data science libraries. And uh, in case of Kale, we can um, quickly write uh, some graph similarity um, implementations uh, to make sense out of the data produced by the execution of unknown binaries. Let's quickly see a demo. So as you could see here, we have already um, executed uh, eBPF um, and executed all the unknown binaries uh, so that eBPF has uh, recorded all the syscalls. And you, we can also use U probes um, to record uh, user level functions as well. But for simplicity's sake, we are just um, mapping the syscalls here. As you could see visually, uh, the similarity between these two samples. So this being the Mirai botnet POC, um, where you can see even though the process name has changed, they both share the same PID. And this particular um, POC, it fundamentally shares the anti-debugging trick, but not the PRCTL trick. Uh, we can use graph data science libraries to um, detect similarities, dissimilarities, uh, community detection uh, for unsupervised clustering. Uh, we can also use Kale uh, to do the visual uh, comparison, and we can implement so many other graph um, algorithms here as well, which we can talk about in a detailed blog. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Dinesh. Amazing to see what is possible with BPF. Uh, that's the first time I'm hearing about this. Um, definitely want to want to uh, dig in further in this. Into, the, into these ideas. I think Dinesh is available on Slack as well. If you have questions for him, Joe has created a thread where you can ask Dinesh questions. Let's give a round of applause to uh, Dinesh. Now we come to our last uh, lightning talk and it's one I'm, I'm personally very much looking forward to. We will be hearing from Andre Ignatov working at Facebook and talking about containers and BPF, uh, the reagent or TW agent story. I'm not sure whether my notes are incorrect or the slides are correct. Uh, story about how, be, how Facebook is using BPF and containers together. Hi, thanks for joining. My name is Andrei Ignatov and I'm a software engineer at Facebook, working on containers and occasionally on Linux kernel. My talk is about the group BPF usage in TW agent. TW agent is a daemon that runs on every Facebook server and manages containers, or as we call them tasks. Every task consists of usual building blocks like cgroups, namespaces, images, etc. Our fleet is on cgroup v2, what allows us to use cgroup bpf. cgroup bpf is a way to attach bpf programs to cgroup of a container so that it will be run only for objects inside this container, for example, for all sockets. CW agent has many features implemented in CGroup BPF. I'll describe a few of them just to give a better idea what can be done. Our DC network is IPv6 only. Every server has slash 64 prefix, and we want to assign IP addresses from this prefix to our tasks. At the same time, many services don't need full L2 isolation and simply want a separate IP address. We handled it with, with a few CGroup BPF programs. Server part is handled by bind program, so that, for example, wildcard pass to bind syscall by TCP server will be overridden by task IP. Client side is handled by connect and send message program, so that outgoing TCP and UDP traffic goes from task IP instead of an IP chosen by kernel. Some applications try to connect to other applications in the same task using colon colon one. We handle it by tracking all listening sockets in a task by TCP BPF program that tracks TCP listen and TCP close states. And when a connect to colon colon one happens, we know if we need to override destination with task IP. This scheme works with the use port, fast open, and has close to zero overhead. Next example is transparent TCP proxy that redirects outgoing TCP traffic of a task to a proxy and lets the proxy know the real destination to connect to. The main use case is transparent TLS for a long tail of services that don't support encryption natively. Again, we do it with a few CGroup BPF programs. 
On Connectis call, we run a program to save original destination in a BPF map and set the proxy IP port as the new destination. Socket cookie is used as the key. Next, we run TCP BPF program on connect callback right before sending scene. This program finds previously saved entry in the map by socket cookie and replaces it by a new entry with source IP port known at this time as the key and original destination as the value. Now the proxy can accept the connection and find original destination for it using the BPF map and source IP port of the connection as the key. Garbage collection happens on TCP calls in the same TCP BPF program. Or it can be done with socket local storage. The link at the bottom of the page describes the proxy logic. And the final feature I'd like to describe is our container firewall. It's two Cgroup BPF programs, ingress and egress attached to a container. It can dissect a packet and is a drop, lock or pass it with some probability. If use case allows, we can replace per packet programs by per socket ones. For example, connect and send message hooks can handle outgoing TCP and UDP traffic. The firewall can be attached either on task start or on daemon at any given time, and the latter is used for network faults injection. The firewall is integrated with our service discovery system so that a service with many endpoints can be described by just one rule. There are many more Cgroup BPF features implemented in TW agent, mostly networking, but not only. But I'd like to finish with a few words about our Cgroup BPF infrared. LibBPF is the only library we use, it naturally aligns with our C++ infrared. We enable BTF everywhere. Uh, we heavily test all our programs, including multi-kernel VM tests in Camo, what caught many bugs both in kernel and in our applications. And finally, we mentor CPU and memory usage of all our programs and maps across the fleet using a tool named BPF Tax. This is all I have for a 5 minute talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. There is so much information in there that you just quickly picked that uh, we definitely need to invite you again to have a longer talk. Amazing to see how many roles eBPF can play from firewalling to resource constraints, IP firewalls, and so on. Um, definitely a, a ton of knowledge that, um, that Andre has been just giving us a quick peek off. Give a round of applause. This was our last uh, lightning talk for today and also of this summit. I'm again really blown away by all of the effort that has gone into this by all the, all the speakers. Um, I think we were definitely able to keep the high level of quality of yesterday. And I think it's already clear that we will host uh, another eBPF summit in the, in, in the future. I would also like to again, thank all the speakers and everybody who helped organize things in the background. We had lots of people who worked behind the scenes, keeping the stream alive, organizing the talks and speakers, help moderate Slack and so on. Without all of them, this summit would never have come together. Give them a round of emoji applause. And um, maybe even more important, all of you have been a wonderful and supportive audience. So thank, thank you all for attending. Before we officially close the first eBPF summit, a couple of more things. First, quick reminder, again, if you're looking for a good starting point to learn more about eBPF, eBPFIO EBPF is a great resource um, for beginners um, as it gives you pointers to in introductions about eBPF and also a list of eBPF projects where you can consume eBPF without actually writing eBPF programs. I think Brandon Gregg mentioned this extremely well in his keynote. Yes, it's very appealing to approach eBPF from a from a developer's perspective first, you want to write this first Hello World program, but in, in reality, what you really want is to use some of the higher level tools first and start exploring from there. And as Brandon, I think, put it very nicely, approach this from a sysadmin perspective. If you are, if you want to contribute to EBPFO, EBPF, 
eBPF.io. You can do so. It is licensed under Creative Commons license and the website is all open source. So if you want to list a project or if you want to add something to the documentation, please do so and you can simply open up a pull request. And let's see what the next slide brings. We I think we have, we're a bit out of sync. Yes, so please give us feedback as well. Um, this is the first time we have been running the eBPF Summit. Um, and we already know a couple of things that we will improve on for the next time. We are actually really, really curious about what you thought about the summit. Keep it a single track, uh, go multi-track, shorter talks, longer talks. Um, all of this is something we would like to know about. So we've put a survey together uh, to help collect feedback. The link to the survey will be in the Slack channel, but you can also scan this QR code on the screen. And with this, we are wrapping up the conference. We will be publishing all the recordings and slides in about one week after we had time to process, cut the recording into individual videos and collect all the slides from the speakers. Uh, again, thank you to all the speakers, attendees, um, Thank you for attending. We're looking forward to seeing you at the next EBPF Summit. Have a wonderful rest of the day.